Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to PerfWeb 33, day two. Uh, I wanna welcome everybody here. I also wanna thank our very generous sponsors, Levanova and Siemens Diagnostics. We really wanna uh, show them our appreciation for their support. So when you see their, their advertisings, advertisements, please click it and learn a little bit more about it. It would be very helpful for us. Before I get started with the introductions today, I'd like to ask all of you to do us a huge favor. If you are watching us on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn, please do one of the following, or all of the following. Like, share, follow, or, and or comment. We really appreciate the comments too. Also for you YouTubers out there, give us that thumbs up, click the subscribe buttons button. We're growing on the subscriptions on YouTube tremendously, but of course you can always watch us at the, at the watch party on Facebook. I mean, there's a lot of opportunity, a lot of different ways you can watch us, but, sh but subscribing on YouTube is very important to us. Thank you. And uh, also go to perfusioneducation.com. It would also be really appreciated and please leave us a testimonial. Very easy to find, perfusioneducation.com. If you would like to be on our program as a presenter and join our ro very robust faculty list, um, join, a, join, join something that is bringing real value to you as a clinician and share that information with your other perfusion colleagues, nursing colleagues, physician colleagues, mid-level colleagues, this is for everybody. Um, that would also be really appreciated. When you see this animation, it means that the phone lines are open. Please call in. Anyone that calls in gets a round trip ticket to the pyramids in Cairo, right? Just outside of Cairo with Dr. Samir. Thank you, that was very generous of you to donate Absolutely. that to us. And, uh, and you'll even get a chance to ride a camel with him. So. Now, let's get to the introductions. Of course, you all already know Dr. Samir, but Dr. Samir is a you know, very well-known, recognized expert, cardiac transplant anesthesiologist, intensive care medicine doctor. He's published, he's given multiple presentations with us. He is currently uh, leading the charge on telemedicine and ICU telemonitoring. Um, and uh, he's an incredibly generous individual with his time and his knowledge and his experience. And he's been here with us several times and I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you being back with us again today. I really enjoy it, Joe. Uh, really, it's a great time to be here, thank you. Thank you. Now he's talking a little low, guys, so make sure his mic is turned up um, or you gotta speak up a little louder, one or the Absolutely other. Absolutely. There you go, thank you. Yeah. So now also who is gonna join us a little later is going to be Tracy Howith. You all remember Tracy from the uh, vape and the, the valley, the vape, vaping associated lung injury when we had Dr. Uh, Joe Thule here. And uh, she's going to be participating in the panel for my final talk on where is the residence of the soul. And uh, she, I think, is going to have some interesting insights and I think we'll have a really good debate. I even bring up a little bit of a little bit of your home country. You're, I bring up some of your ancestors and what they used to believe. So I'm looking forward to that. Well, I'm really looking forward to that too. Now that's going to be good. So, but Dr. Samir is going to be talking about the transfer of ECMO patients to a quaternary care facility. So you're at a you're at a place that is uh, that is is putting an ECMO in a community based hospital. The patient needs a transplant. The patient needs a permanent VAD. They don't do them there, but they have at least the patient stabilized and uh, then what do you do with that patient and you need to transfer them and the mechanisms and the, the 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 flow associated all of the logistical considerations are going to have to play in in order to do that or be right in order to do that safely so i think that i'm really looking forward to that talk stephanie is doing a heart she was going to be here stephanie ebus you all know her uh and rodell ebus her husband worked all night. So the beauty of medicine is when you plan these programs, you really have to try to plan them around the emergency schedule, because I'll tell you what, when it goes bad, it goes bad in a hurry. But nevertheless, we're going to have a great program today because at the end of the day, we only need one person here. And Dr. Samir, that's you. Oh, you are really too kind today. 
I am. I, feel I like am I'm being set up. Uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I don't know if anybody noticed or not, but Dr. Samir has a coffee cup over there. He he would not use our Perf Web cup. Anyone that calls in today will get a Perf Web cup sent to you. We just need your name and address, obviously. On your, on your trip to Egypt. On your trip to Egypt to enjoy on the flight. Okay. So with all of that said, why don't we go ahead and we can get started with my uh, first talk. And Magic, could you do me a favor and just uh, on the YouTube, just put a, a little blurb in there that uh, we welcome them and please chat any questions oh. here. Okay, so he'll do that. Or I could do it if you don't have it up. Okay, okay, good. I'll give you a moment. Okay. Everyone else is gonna give you a moment too. Okay, so my talk today first one is going to be on on pump versus off pump cabbage. Oh, clicker. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Okay. How do I turn it on? Oh yeah. Okay. Okay. There you go. On pump and off pump cabbage. Now, as you know, this has been a hotly debated topic Beyond. for years. It's been beaten up for years. But I want to bring up something I think new to it that may be important for us to understand. And the question is, have I been wrong all these years? Because I have strongly advocated against it. So I'll answer that question at the end of my presentation. Are you, are you ever wrong? That's my question. No. I didn't think so. No, absolutely not. So let's go to the next slide. It's, it's not working. Oh, there it goes. Okay. So here is, let me, uh, this is killing me. Too many, too many screens. That's not the slide I wanted. It's, there we go. Okay. So <laughs> the undeniable facts, I'm glad I could be of, I'm glad I could be comedic relief today. The undeniable facts are that I have been critical of off pump cabbage surgery for years, except ever since it started, except in very specific isolated circumstances. Off pump cabbage has been studied and debated for years. Off-pump cases peaked around 2011 at about 31% of the cases being done off-pump. Today, it is around 11% or actually less, and there is a good reason for that. In selective cases, however, for very specific reasons, as I said, it is a good option. You need to be able to do that sometimes eggshell aorta, various other, you know, things like that. Single vessel, single lima to the LAD, and you want to do it as a T-cab. I can understand that, but you still really have to be concerned about the long-term durability of that graft. That is why the patient is there at the end of the day. However, what are the facts, the undeniable facts in this whole argument? Well, Along comes this article by the Journal of American College of Cardiology is where, this is where it was published. Now this was only about two years ago. Long-term outcomes after off-pump versus on-pump coronary artery bypass grafting, grafting by experienced surgeons. And that's a very important point. And let me go to this slide. They studied over 20,000 patients, so the N number is enormous. Not only did they match the off-pump versus on-pump or compare them, the off-pump were done by surgeons who typically do off-pump, and the on-pump was done by surgeons who typically only do on-pump. So you have, you, you have patient matching and you have surgeon matching to what their typical skill set is. And that's a very, very, very important piece. However, at the end of the day, patients tended to be the on-pump patients when 
they had underlying renal dysfunction, ESRD and dialysis dependent, recent MI, an EF of less than 35%, diabetics, uh, left main disease, three vessel disease, peripheral vascular disease, and previous stroke. Now, in my view, if that is how you match the, hey, come on up. Is that if that is how you match these patients, then at the end of the day, you've taken the sicker of the patients and put them into the group that should have, at the end of the day, worse outcomes. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. Does anybody out there disagree with that? Let me know. So I can stop my talk right here. This is the end of this is the this could be the end of my presentation. And if you look at the blue line, which is off pump versus the orange line, which is on pump, and you look at cumulative event rate, rate that stroke, MI, renal failure, and need for revascularization after the procedure, re-revascularization, if you will, you can see clearly by that graph that it is, it is superior, you have less frequency with on pump versus off pump. So let's just drill down on it a little bit and see what's going on here. So from top left going over to the right, myocardial infarction, essentially the same. Stroke rate, essentially the same. Down bottom right, new renal failure requiring dialysis, essentially the same. But the need for repeat revascularization, and what that really means is early graft failure is clearly, you can see that you can see daylight between those lines, you can't with the other ones, and that's where the difference really lies. When you do off-pump surgery, not only are you contorting the heart and trying to operate on it from odd angles because you have to keep a perfusion pressure and flow because you don't have the pump supporting the patient, you also are at odd angles bleeding non-stability, and you're trying to create the same quality of anastomosis that you would create if it was a completely bloodless, still field where you didn't have to worry about protecting the brain, protecting the kidneys, protecting the other, the other organs. You were flowing, and the heart was protected with cardioplegia. So, in their study, and by the way, this came from a New Jersey mandated registry. New Jersey mandates the registry. So all of this information was required to be put in it. And at the conclusion, off pump was associated with increased incomplete revascularization, repeat revascularization. So, so keep that in mind. Incomplete revascularization is almost just as bad as early graft failure and mortality at 10 years compared with the on-pump cabbage group, suggesting that on-pump cabbage may be the appropriate choice for most patients undergoing surgical revascularization. And, you know, and why, you know, why we see it go from 31% to maybe under 11 to 10.5% today is for that very reason. But there are still some people out there who insist on doing all of their cases off-pump and I frankly just do not understand why. The data, I don't think is arguable in my view. There's been several studies like this. This isn't the only one. So I can't quite understand it. I put this STS database link up there and I wanna leave it up there for a few minutes and I'll just quickly talk about it um, so people can copy it or have an opportunity to see what it says. But it's essentially riskcalc.sts.org slash STS web risk calc slash calculate. Go to that and you can probably just go to STS.org and search for it and find it. It's very easy, but we should be doing these. Perfusion should be doing these. Certainly anesthesia should be doing these. Anytime you're in the OR, it's very easy to do. They even have an app for your phone. So it's simple to do, but it really gives you a window into what the risk this patient has of early uh, of, of mortality, of, uh, of renal failure and of stroke, the three things that are really important to us that we see every day. Um, and uh, that's, I think, gonna be my goal today is talk about 
some of these morbidities that are associated with heart surgery even when on pump. Because as I said, stroke rate was equal, new renal failure requiring dialysis was equal, MI rate was equal. The only thing that was different was in the early graft failure or incomplete revascularization. That doesn't mean, that doesn't give me much comfort. I would rather on pump was better in reducing stroke. I would rather on pump was better at reducing renal failure. And can we get there? That's really what the challenge is. So when you look at morbidities associated with cabbage, stroke rate is anywhere from 0.5 to 7%, depending on the procedure and depending on a lot of other variables, but it's around that. Renal failure, 0.6 to 5%. Even a small increase in the serum creatinine level, which is not unusual after pump, is in, in, it uh, holds a three to four fold increase in long-term risk of end-stage renal disease. So the question to my colleagues is, how can we make being on CPB better? How can we make the pump better? That's what we should be doing. You know, I remember when we went from bubble, well, from, from I mean, we went from, from screen and disc oxygenators to bubble oxygenators, we thought that was revolutionary then to membrane oxygenators, which are really microporous oxygenators, not true membranes. We went to that, but that was in the, that was in like the, the, nine, the late 80s. What have we done differently since then? Now we have some, you know, passive bio, uh, biocompatibility. We had, you know, of course we had the Carmita for a while, which is a, which is a biologic uh, 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 bio coating that they put on a lot of tubing, used them for liver transplants and all that kind of stuff. But you know, it's for some heparin, you know, so the system was, so the system wouldn't clot, but that leached out after a period of time. We don't, I don't think see that very often anymore, but they have the non-biologic smart coding, they call it now. Um, but I think industry has to step it up and start really making a, a, a system that reduces the inflammatory processes that occur when you go on pump to a bare minimum. We can't do a whole lot with sternotomy. Um, that's just gonna cause inflammation on its own. We used to use a protonin, but of course a protonin has been gone. Some, if we could find some additional pharma, uh, pharmaceutical agent that could block the inflammatory process, calocrine inhibiting units that we could find like Trasolol or a protonin had, that would be great. But I think the pump itself they can do a lot to it to reduce that inflammatory uh, stimulus that occurs. So at, when we perfuse, all we ever really look at, really measure, is the macro circulation. We've talked about this, I've talked about it, uh, but all of the nutrient and waste exchange occurs in the capillary bed. That's where it all has to happen. The, 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 the macro vasculature is simply to get the blood there and then bring it back so it can be processed again and sent back around. So the microvascular is very important. And we, do me we don't measure it clearly, but we measure things that infer. So we look at blood gases, we look at lactate levels, we look at other metabolites to assess how efficiently we are perfusing this patient. But is that enough? So these are two images of the microcirculation using sublingual uh, uh, side stream dark field imaging. And the one on the left is essentially a normal patient. The one on the right is a patient who is in septic shock. Now, I will tell you that I have done this and I'll sh I, I'm not going to show you in this particular presentation, but I've done this in the operating room with a patient going on bypass and have seen the microcirculation sublingually disappear. Now it came back, but it disappeared right off the beginning. And it was very disconcerting to me. And I think there are some phenomenon that occur that I, and I think hemodilution was a big part of that. So one of the one of the uh, uh, parts, if you will, of the endothelium, which is, I think, poorly understood, though it's common, but poorly understood. You know, you know, it wasn't discovered 
until 1970. Wow. I didn't, the glycocalyx. Wow. 1970. I mean, that's 50 years. We should be a lot farther along than this. Absolutely. But when you really think about it in medicine, that's maybe really not that long ago. No, I mean, 10 years in medicine is like a minute. Yes. And I don't feel like we, but I don't feel like we, as a profession and perfusion profession, have really given this much consideration. And I want to talk about some things about it that I think really, really piqued my curiosity. So what is the role of this glycocalyx? Well, it has endothelial function. It, uh, it, it's a nitric oxide synthesis, synth synthesis, or it helps in the synthesis of nitro nitric oxide, I should say. It's shear induced. It uh, controls permeability. So it's a sieving barrier. When you lose your glycocalyx, you're gonna have albumin pass through, proteins pass through into the interstitium and that's gonna create edema. It is beneficial in coagulation, inhibits platelet adherence, and it prevents leukocyte adhesion and inflammation. So it does a lot of stuff, but again, we don't really think about it very often. And I'm gonna show you some things that are really interesting. So take a look at this slide. On the top, you have a healthy glycocalyx. And that, if you look down on the right, you see the down on the right of that picture, you see the size. That measurement, that little line at the bottom is 0 0.1 microns. 0 0.1 microns. That's 0 0.0001 uh, uh, millimeters. That is extremely, extremely small. So it's very, very small. Now, the next picture that you see is, the, is obviously a damaged glycocalyx. You see where the vascular lumen is. You can clearly see it's damaged. And then you see beneath it is the endothelial cells. And then on the third, that is disorganized. So there's various different things that can occur to the glycocalyx for a variety of reasons and breakdown of this important barrier can have real, very significant uh, ill effects. So when we look at this slide here, and I got this from a Master of Science nursing student uh, poster presentation, and it talks about what the glycocalyx is. You know, mostly it's a, uh, it's a, uh, uh, it's a, uh, mm. Yeah, glycoprotein and lipid protein. Um, so that's its comp basic composition, but it helps, as I said, with regulating nitric oxide, vascular tone, endothelial wall stress, uh, uh, permeability, inflammation, all of these things. And when you have a breakdown, you can get capillary leak syndrome, edema, increased inflammation, platelet aggregation, hypercoagulability, loss of vascular tone. So these are big deals. And if you take a look here, it explains that in sepsis, now I would argue that when we go on pump, we're not septic, but there are phenomena similar to sepsis that you see when you put somebody on cardiopulmonary bypass. Absolutely. But there's a degradation and the layer becomes thinner and more sparse, allowing plasma proteins vis-a-vis -vis albumin and fluid to move across the vascular wall, leading to tissue edema. We've all seen those patients. They're swollen up. That edema is coming from a capillary leak. This is part of it. Now, I know they used to have a drug called Zygris. I don't know if you remember Zygris oh, or not. I remember very well. I was one of the uh, sub eyes for the study. Really? Okay. Yes. Yeah, so Zygris would be used to try and inhibit that loss of, of capillary leakage. It was, it was, that's what it was for, to protect against capillary leakage. But uh, if that's correct. So what, what more do you know about it? Well, it does decrease the inflammatory response. But I'll tell you just before one thing. Before Zygris, there's an institution which um, where I did so, some of my training that routinely gave a gram of steroids on pump. There was a routine case for them. 
mm-hmm. whether that's right or wrong, but that was the same concept too. So, uh, so Zag- Zagar's activated protein C was, how was supposed to help with the uh, inflammatory response. Right. So, and that was actually, was that at the same time we were using a protein? I think it was. It was around the same time. And I'm going to have a one disclosure here and don't hit me. I'm a big a protein fan. And I think it was, we're doing, we did the disservice to the cardiac community by abandoning it. I still, think so too. Still being used in Germany. We had it for a while after it was banned for compassionate Magic. care. And I think it really worked a lot. Mm-hmm. I think it worked too. I think it worked too. I thought it was a great drug. In fact, we, we, I, remember doing, I remember doing cases, doing type one dissections. And we would come off bads. pump and they would be dry, as chip dry. Transplants, bads, everything. They just did, they just did great with it. I, I'll yeah. tell you what, it was something else. So the effects of CPB are well known. Inflammatory activation, prothrombotic profile, there's, we, we vary temperatures, uh, hemodilution, we still use, irrespective of the uh, systemic blood pressure, we still have these things happen. So you can be high pressure, low pressure, mid pressure, doesn't make any difference. There's still ill effects of CPB, no matter what you do leads to a reduction also in functional capillaries. And that's very important because again, all of the nutrient and waste exchange occurs at the capillary level. And when you start getting capillary bridging, you start getting shunting, you start losing capillary density, you have a big problem. Can I start trouble or not yet? No, you can start trouble right now. I can start trouble right now? Yeah, do it, let's do it. Okay, so uh, let me tell you, I agree with you 100%. So what's your thoughts about doing off pump with uh, an, uh, an assist device on board. With okay. an assist device, you mean like one of those? Like let's start from the balloon pump to all the way to uh, 5.0 Impala to, uh, uh, to a little ECMO. There's, a, there's talk, you know, there's some surgeons believe uh, ECMO doesn't cause inflammatory response like the pump. And there's a lot of transplant surgeons I that, think that that's believe naive. that. naive. I understand, but some of the transplant surgeons that are really experienced, they believe that. Mm-hmm. And I don't, I don't agree with that idea 100%, but how about doing the off pump with the balloon pump or, uh, or 5 o Impala or a little ECMO? Well, and I'll tell you why I say that. Mm-hmm. I agree with everything you said, but now I'm starting to get a little older and see some other cases that I think off pump is indicated. And I'll give you a good example. Patient pre-op for a liver transplant, one vessel disease. Mm-hmm. You know, liver patients bleed like crazy. So for me to put it to get a one, uh, one vessel done off pump, I think would be a good idea for the I patient. I do too. I would, add, I would support that 100%. And see, I'm learning a lot in that transplant area. Kidney transplant, going to go one vessel bypass uh, off pump. And I have to tell you, one of our surgeons that you probably don't know is doing an amazing job with that. Mm-hmm. He's doing all these off pumps for these cases. And the question is, do you really have to have the most protein graft? You just try not to get the, die during the transplant. Well, you're right, but you're ta- right. I understand that. And I think all of those are very, now if the patient is waiting for a transplant, a kidney transplant, they're on the transplant list, I don't really see any benefit to doing that patient off pump. I think the liver patient who is waiting for a liver or someone who is a fresh kidney transplant because they're more vulnerable, I would advocate. I think that what I'm trying to say is not that off pump should never be done. I, I would never say that, but it shouldn't be done for a normal routine procedure with a patient that has an acceptable level of comorbidities that should make the operations uh, uh, very simple to do on it's because it's a better anastomosis. They're going to live another 20 years. You don't want them to have a repeat revascularization. That's the problem. But we have to make the pump less inflammatory, less risk of stroke. When you're on pump, not equal, I want it to be less. And I think one of the things we don't do well is understand and appreciate this glycocalyx and how much that actually influences. And I'm gonna get a little further into it because it is good point, you have good points. So, but I do agree with you. I think some patients should be done off pump. So I agree with that. I just don't think that you should do a, I don't, if I needed bypass surgery at my age and my condition as I am right now, I want it on pump. 
Oh, me too. And I want a big incision up and down my chest so I can show it off at the pool. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, very good. So, protection of the, this, uh, Dr. Koning did this dissertation. And this thing is, it's massive and it's incredible. And I really recommend that anybody who has an interest in this to read this because it's very, very informative, really well done. So reduction of the sublingual microcirculation with CPB. And just so you understand, the sublingual region, and there's a ridge, is a very easily accessible area where you can visualize the microcirculation. There's very strong uh, evidence to support that that, micro, that ridge, that microcirculation, is mirroring your actual gut perfusion. So that if this is deranged, that's deranged as well, and something to really take into consideration. So it's more global. This is a very good window into what's happening all over, in the milieu, if you will, of the body. So the glycocalyx integrity and loss of microcirculation is diminished with CPB, hemodilution, hypothermia, again, irrespective of the mean arterial pressure. Now, this is a very important slide. If you look at the uh, part on the left, this is looking at perfused vessel density. What you want is it for it to stay equal or close to equal. So if you look at the left off pump of, of A, of, of, of section A, you have a baseline, which is the white. You have the light gray, which is off pump, uh, which is intraoperative. And then you have the dark, which is your postoperative. So you can see that the microcirculation was maintained. When you look at non pulsatile perfusion, you see an immediate drop in uh, perfused vessel density, which means capillaries are farther apart. So you have less ability to get oxygen and nutrient to the tissue and remove waste becomes decreased. And it lingers even in the postoperative period. Interestingly enough, if you use pulsatile perfusion, and I have, I have said pulsatile perfusion the way we do it doesn't work, but clearly I was wrong in this study. And you look, you can see intraoperatively there is a drop, but it returns postoperatively much faster. That's very important. If you look at the uh, slide, the, the section on the right, B, this is looking at perfused boundary region. And what this is measuring is the diameter of the capillary itself. And if you look at the off pump, you can see that there is a, a, de a slight decrease, but now this is inverse. You don't want this to be uh, higher. You want it to be lower or equal. So for some reason it ended up as being lower, which means that the diameter did not get any larger. But if you look to the non-pulsatile and the pulsatile perfusion, both, both intraoperatively and postoperatively, the actual diameter or the boundary from edge to edge got bigger. What that means is something was lost. What was lost? What was lost was the glycocalyx. That's what the issue is. So, not only do you lose capillary surface area, you lose the glycocalyx, making your capillary larger, but of course, invasion of white blood cells, leaking of fluid, et cetera, et cetera. And if you look on the left, you see what would be normal. So you see the, uh, the, on the top part, you have the cross section, you have the uh, looking at it through the diameter. And then on the bottom, you have the cross section of it. You see the glycocalyx you see the endothelial cells. If you look to the right, you can see how that has disappeared. And this can be caused, this one here, interestingly enough, was a, 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 a aortic surgery, ascending aortic surgery. And the cause of this, if you look at the conclusions, this study provides the first evidence in humans for shedding of the endothelial, glyca, gl, uh, uh, endothelial glycocalyx during ischemia and reperfusion procedures. So this was actually a circulatory arrest case. And you can see that just that alone 
So what I suspect is, well, let's do this first. Have I been wrong? Graph patency long-term is improved with CPB. Major morbidity and mortality is equal or superior with CPB. However, short-term microcirculatory changes and shedding of the glycocalyx have been visualized and reported. However, the clinical significance of this is yet to be determined. And I think that's a very important point that you have to consider in this. So can we improve on CPB-associated morbidities, reducing the hemodilution? I contend that when you go on bypass, and you open that venous line and you empty the heart and the, the venous capacitance system and you start the pump forward and you have all of that crystalloid going through, that has a deleterious effect. That shift, that change, especially in viscosity, I believe can wash out the glycocalyx and have a problem. And I'm gonna show you something to validate that. We need to reduce inflammation, or the hemodilution. We need to attenuate inflammation process, improve pulsatility. So pulsatility does work. I've argued for years it didn't, it didn't make any difference because normally the pump can't really create a physiologic pulse. But, you know, and then look at all the total artificial hearts that are done now. They're all, they're all a continuous flow pumps. Absolutely. So why do we have continuous flow pumps if you need a pulse? They're, people are living with a continuous flow forever. So there's probably some level of adaptability that happens in the long term. That's what I assume. Well, I'm curious about one thing about the pump. So I'm going to ask two controversial questions. Do you, uh, are you advocating wrapping for every case? No, I don't believe in wrapping at all. I think that has its own set of problems. But what I am advocating for is mixing. I think rap is ridiculous. It's a silly thing to do. It's I think a, it's dangerous. Associated with renal failure, high level of renal failure. And that's what I believe. But I know the thing You is, think it causes renal failure? Yes. I agree with you. We agree on that. But a lot of my perfusion colleagues out there will argue with us back and they'll, they'll argue to the end of the year. In fact, Rodell, if he was here, would be arguing until he was blue in the face. I'll, I'm ready to take him on because I'll tell you, I believe in rap causes renal failure. And then the other question is, do you remember back in the old days when you used to prime with blood, are you at, uh, would you want to bring those days back? We may have to. I think we really need to study this. I don't think we know enough is what our problem is. I don't think we really know. We think we do, but we used to think bubble oxygenators were uh, the best thing since sliced bread. It'll never get any better than this. Then I'm going to ask you another controversy. Today is controversy day. What is a bubble uh, oxygenator? No. <laughs> See, you really want me to start with you. Can I get a drone here, please? Um, what what uh, hemoglobin level are you comfortable with on pump? It depends on the patient. I think I don't think there is a magic number. I think if it's a 28-year-old young female mitral valve repair and she were to drop to 19 or 20 or even 18 and tolerated it fine, I'd I mean leave it alone. He meant hematocrit. Yeah, yeah, hematocrit. If she's, well, let's say six, hemoglobin. If it's a 74-year-old grandmom with a depressed LV already um, and we do whatever operation, cabbage or whatever we're going to do on her, I'd rather she had a crit of 30. Uh, or a hemoglobin of 10 coming off pump. On pump or coming off? Coming off. No, I on, mean on pump like on the, in the middle of the case. Well, I think it depends on, it's all driven by DO2. Am I flowing, can I, flow, can I deliver enough oxygen to this patient? Not am I flowing enough, because you, flow, you could flow 10 liters a minute, but if, you're, if your hemoglobin's one, it doesn't make any difference. I think that another thing that we don't measure routinely, which we should, is DO2. I think that's really the magic formula. If we can keep that at least above 600 um, milliliters per minute, then I would say you're, you're pretty safe, especially if you have a little hypothermia. You could probably go even down to 500, but I think when you're warm, um, you really wanna make sure that that's uh, 700, 750 is probably a good number for that, but we don't measure it routinely. We just measure flow and don't consider the hemoglobin is low. 
because the surgeons don't want to be dinged for giving too many transfusions. Because if they give the transfusion, they get dinged on their, their, their blood reduction program. And it's all just, you know, and blood, you know, is, is, is known to have ill effects. And I certainly recognize that. But the question is, which is worse? Lack of adequate oxygen carrying capacity or the risk of blood transfusions? I don't have the answer to that. But what you can do going on pump is you can mix. In the old days, that's what we used to do because we had so much fluid for hemodilution. So to avoid the patient having this minute worth of flow of nothing but crystalloid while you're trying to get the blood to come through the whole system because it was so big, we would take a little, add a little, take a little, add a little, just very little bit until we mixed everything and then we would go on bypass. So there wasn't this rush of nothing but crystalloid going into the patient. And it seemed to work really well. You didn't have as many episodes of profound hypotension immediately upon initiating bypass, which I, I see quite frequently. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So with all of that said, I have uh, caused more questions than I have answers and uh, we'll open it up to any discussion and uh, criticisms and thoughts. You can open the phone line too if you want. Anybody calls, free trip with Dr. Samir and his lovely wife to Egypt to see the pyramids and a, from me, a perfweb.us cup. Wow. That's a bonus. And look at this. I have this cup, and what's he using? He's using. He's not even using our cups for his coffee. Because he wouldn't want to give me one. He was just stingy with me. It hurts. <laughs> so, any questions or comments? No, I think uh, to be honest with you, like you said, if I were, I wanted to have surgery, I would. I would have on pump. You would have on pump. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would too. Clinton, what would I you do? I, uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. One thing I would say, I would my, my hemoglobin above uh, eight. Eight? I want eight would be the maximum hemoglobin. Maximum I mean, or minimum? Maximum. So, you want, you, so you're okay with the hemoglobin of seven? Absolutely. I'm a big believer in viscosity. I think viscosity is very deleterious. So I think eight, I'm very happy with eight. Really? Yes. See, I think only, the, I feel only, the only other way. Only give me eight, I'm good. Okay, I Perfect. feel the other way. I think these older, fragile patients, whether male or female, that have a lot of comorbidities, a lot of other organ dysfunction, underlying renal insufficiency, uh, pulmonary problems, notwithstanding the risk of transfusions, I just feel like they do better drier, and I feel they do better with a higher hemoglobin. I'm At least that's been my experience. I don't have any proof. I'm a hemoglobin of eight. I'll be happy with viscosity. You have to remember, renal failure patients are walking around in the world with a hemoglobin of seven. Most of them. True. That's how they're walking around in the world. True. I mean, but if, they don't have if, any kidneys. If, if the nurses call me and tell me, our patient has a hemoglobin of seven renal failure, I would say maybe give one unit on, on dialysis. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really believe in viscosity and microemboli. So I'm very concerned about that. And that's why I worry about high, I mean, high hemoglobin. So let me ask you this. Do you, okay, so if you, all things considered, how much of it is a number versus how much of it is how the patient looks clinically, whether it be their acid base status, their heart rate, uh, the respiratory rate, all these various things, how they look. Um, how they look is the most so, important thing, but sometimes you don't have time, Joe. Sometimes you have to make a split-second decision. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, with split-second, I will uh, hover around eight. And, but if you have time, how it looks, and you can get lactates, and you can look at SVO2 and look at all that, I'm happy to take that time. But if I have to make a split-second, it's eight. Okay. I want ten. Well, not for, me, because I'm pretty you. healthy. For you, we're gonna get you a couple of more units. Couple, I don't, right now, I don't need any. Okay. Right now, I don't need any. Okay, so, Clinton, do you want transfusions or what do you want? I want the pump up, 
You want the pump? That's what I'm saying that we've solved all the world's problems. Well, all because the problems Clinton are over. is an amazing engineer, so he knows more than us about the exactly. flow exactly. and all that. Exactly. Okay, so you want to you wanna take a uh, uh, five-minute break, and then we'll come back to Dr. Samir, and we'll get Tracy to come up here a little longer? Yeah, a little longer, maybe 10. 10 minutes? Yeah. You sure that long? You're the boss, David. You're the okay. boss. Okay. Okay, everybody, we're going to do a 10-minute break, if you don't mind, and we'll be back in 10 minutes, don't, not more than 10 minutes. So we'll be back in 10 minutes, okay? All right, see you all in 10 minutes. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the Wrap Venous Cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the Easy Flow Aortic Cannula and the Wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova Easy Flow Duo Cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy Flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible, direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Point of Care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary as we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community. The need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. They will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes 
a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, that's just how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. And you're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. Okay, and welcome back, okay? So now we are going to move into our next presentation, which I think is gonna be great. It is transporting of the ECMO patient. And Dr. Samir, you're gonna be giving this lecture. Uh, and I see you're, you're, you know, I didn't even tell people that you were an assistant professor. I forgot to tell anybody that. It's okay, I, I'll cry later, but maybe I'll get over it. I feel bad now, but anyway, so. You should. I do. So Dr. Samir, transporting the ECMO patient, teach us something. Okay, so really I think I, I wanted to change the title to ECMO Without Borders. I learned a lot from preparing for this lecture. Especially all of us are familiar with what's going on right now. Between coronavirus, there's no boundary. So we have to think of the, taking care of these patients without boundaries. And I'm gonna go over some uh, methodologies. And thanks to a lot of my friends in Qatar, Australia for teaching me a lot. And I, I apologize for the first slide with Joe's picture, a little scary, I know. <laughs> I, I, yes, I remember that night. Um, I, uh, Joe, you remember this ECLS data, I'm sure you know it very well. Okay, I think this data is gonna be blown totally out of the picture by next year. With coronavirus uh, and transporting patients across countries, not across states not to the next county. Now we need to think across countries. You know, our, our citizens were stuck in Japan. I mean, are you gonna leave them there or are you gonna uh, put them on ECMO, bring them here? We have the military doing an amazing job, which I'm sure Joe is familiar from Landshall in Germany, bringing patients here. So I'll tell you, we need to learn from them and we need to learn from other people. So I already believe this ECLS data is gonna to be totally blown out of the water. And survivor is going to improve more and more because we learned a lot more. That's what I'm talking about, bringing patients to specialized centers. You can accumulate them wherever you are, get your surgeons to fly there, but bring them to the specialized center for a lot of reasons. We'll talk about that later. <clears throat> so why should we bring patients from a small country hospital 
to the medical center. It's available the infrastructure. Yes, we can, can relate the patients. Like Joe knows, every cardiac surgeon can go to venous cannula, arterial cannula, get the patient ready for transport. Joe, would you rather do that or get the patients uh, cannulated by the surgeons of the receiving hospital? Oh, I would, I would rather. I think that for the, for, I think for patient survival, you want to do it where the patient is and then do the transport. I think time is, you know, time, time is life. But would you want the surgeons, let's say, for the med center oh. to fly to out to, to, uh, to Odessa or just get the Odessa surgeons to do that uh, the cannulation? Oh, well, I think it would depend on whether the surgeons in Odessa, which I assume they would be able to, could cannulate the patient safely. As long as they're qualified to do it, then I would rather they did it there and got the patient on ECMO and wait, because otherwise that's just gonna take way too much time to get the surgeons there to do the cannulation in a place they're not even familiar with. They can get the patient and then re-cannulate them if they want to later. I agree 100%. And I think the best uh, uh, like setup for this situation would be the transferring center should have an agreement with somebody in the world, this is gonna happen, this is a contingency plan. And then the plan should not be like that day. It should be like a plan ongoing for a long time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to make up that stuff as you go along. These protocols help a lot. And here's the cannulations. You guys all know that. We're just going for the people who do not know that. Arteria venous oxygenator pump. Now, why, why is this picture? Here's a, a like pits and tra transfers. K is in the groin slipping out. And I'm sure you've seen that. Patient will be rock stable in the OR or the ICU. You get them on the bus or the helicopter, all of a sudden it's chattering, there's not enough volume, we cannot flow. So care has to be uh, paid attention to those cannulas while transferring. Joey, agree? I agree 100%, and those cannulas are not the way they should be for being in the ICU. They're not secured in a way that would make me comfortable. And that's the reason I put this picture on, because I didn't think they were either. And a couple of stitches around the cannulas are not gonna keep it from moving. So really they have to be very secured very well, and I assign somebody to hold the cannulas as we're transferring the patient. That's the only way, you could, because that person has to move with the patient. Not the patient moves and the cannula is in one another place. And I'm sure you've seen that. I've seen them pop out. Yeah. I've seen it, I mean, literally come out. And it's catastrophic. Absolutely. It's not recoverable. I'll tell you what, one thing which I learned, and you know, it give me less chest pain, put, try to put everything between the patient's legs, put the patient's legs together, will hold everything together as, as everybody is pushing everything together. Neck cannula, same, same nightmare again. Please pay attention. If any of you have seen a cannula come out, it's like a laser gun shooting out. And then you're gonna lose all the blood volume part by death. Yes, it's, okay. it's not recoverable, as I said. It's, it's, it just isn't. So really, I would assign one person to the cannula, whether it's in the neck or the groin. Something very simple, but we don't do it. And again, I'll ask you, see again, as much as everything's gonna be stitched, it's gonna come out if it wants to come out. And Joe will tell you, if a device wants to come out, it will come out. You just have to pay attention. So, you know, uh, the, the, so why we're sending patients out? A specialized center with all the cardiac surgeons, all the protocols, nitric oxide, all kinds of uh, transplant backup, other equipment backup, you know, critical care, that's how, why you want to send these patients out. And now, another idea that has come up to light uh, recently, if you cannot send these patients out, you should consider put a, like having a tele-ECMO program in your institution. I Absolutely, mean, I agree with that 100%. And we, yeah, you know, and that is something I think that is going to have to be done for a variety of reasons. One, I think that it raises significantly the level of care that a patient's going to receive, but it does so at the same time as reducing dramatically the uh, cost of providing this service. There are hospitals that do not provide ECMO because they know how much it's going to cost and they can't pick and choose so they don't have it at all. And that's a big problem. And I think really, 
telemedicine is the way of the future. So having teleacmo is the same concept as tele-ICU. You can have a board certified critical care physician, which the nurses can uh, call and get uh, consultations from. The other physicians can get consultations, provide support uh, for, the, for the hospital. It will be available 24-7. What the physician can come right in and take a look at the uh, patient, take a look at the equipment, adjust flows, adjust oxygenation. And that can be run by, if I don't mean to interrupt you, but that can actually be a situation where, and I'm not trying to kick my colleagues to the curb here, but cost is a big issue and even staffing is a big issue. If you don't have enough perfusionists to sit around the clock and still operate, you have to make a decision. Are we going to shut our heart program down because we have an ECMO or are we going to find another solution? And I think the ECMO specialist model with a telemedicine certified ECMO uh, uh, physician, critical care medicine physician, can make the decision and say, call the perfusionist if it's something you think needs an intervention that a perfusionist should do. But it relieves the perfusionist of that 24 seven burden being at the bedside where they can be available for doing the bypass for the hearts. Absolutely. That's what I think anyway. And again, this is what's currently happening in a lot of the hospitals for ICU and we should, it should go to ECMO because you want to have the expertise, which is not, uh, not available immediately in a lot of hospitals. You have the expertise and you can call them in and consult with them. Again, more of why we should transport patients. Now, this is a paper, a very interesting paper. And I'll let uh, Joe- Dr. Noon, oh my God, Dr. La Fuente. She has surprised you with this paper. George Noon, man, I would heard that name in a long time. And is he still alive? Dr. Noon, yes, sir. He is? And he, he looks great, and I see him every other morning having coffee and the hospital is amazing. Well, don't tell him I asked that question. <laughs> He's an amazing gentleman. And Dr. La Fuente is the primary cardiac surgeon from Methodist Katie, and he is a great friend and a great person. And he worked a lot with Dr. Noon to develop transplant, uh, VADs, and the biomedicals, which I think we forget to talk about. Because biomedicals is how everything started. Do you agree or no? Agreed. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. So biomedicals, and still right now, is one of the, correct me, I'm wrong, the cheapest pump. Is it the cheapest pump? No, Medtronic owns it now. Okay, so it's not cheap anymore? Oh, no. No. They took it, relabeled it? Medtronic re, owns re, it. Repackaged it? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, back in the day, are you going to agree that biomedicals was the cheapest? Um, it will, for the longest time, it was the only centrifugal pump option. So, you know, I think that it had, uh, because of that, a lot of, uh, a lot of market share. And yes, it was uh, uh, the more inexpensive of the models. But then, you know, other companies started building them and they got smaller and all that kind of thing. Uh, less prime volume um, and fancier, less heat generation in the bearings. And of course, you know, then it sort of distributed itself out. But by, but Medtronic has come up with a uh, with a lot. I cannot believe you put perfusion.com on here of all things. I cannot believe you used this picture. That's killing me. I'm sorry. sorry. I can't believe you did that. You okay, need. It's I, hard I to mean, you. Okay, you can call your friend Roxanne and let you go talk to her later. I mean, uh, uh, okay. Yes, I do. Yeah, I need shout to talk out to Roxanne. Roxanne. This is her horrible. Uh, but anyway, with that said, uh, I think that now it's you know, com I would say competitive. They're competitive, but it's not the cheapest anymore. But remember why Biomedicus was successful for a long time. Because Biomedicus was the component for the heart-lung machine. And if somebody needed to go on a VAD, they just took part of it. Correct. And that, and that's, that was the easy part. Correct. Can you tell me a little about how would you feel about transporting patients with Biomedicus? It's cumbersome. It's mm -hmm. difficult. It's a little bit bulky and, uh, you know, there are other tools that are perhaps a little easier. But of course, I've seen these put on different carts and yeah, there's all sorts of iterations of these things. Well, to be honest with you, a lot of institutions say, uh, have a biomedical setup primed for an RVET support just in the closet, mm -hmm. again. Well, I, yes, I think they have that or they have whatever version they use. So you can do RVAD support with, of course, you can, you know, you, there are Impella, the Impella RP, a little difficult to get in. There's the Levanova, the, the old tandem heart, the, what is that called? The Protect Duo, which is a RV 
bypass, you know, a catheter goes into the pulmonary artery. But I mean, um, you cannot come off pump. You cannot come you, off pump. You can yeah, you can use any centrifugal closing, pump, exactly. though. Not necessarily the biomedics. We don't only I mean, the, the reason, it old was cheaper guys. Than, exactly, the old guy because it was cheaper at the, the time. Right. The old guys call it get the biomedicus, yeah. but we just now say get the ECMO. We're going to go, you know, on ECMO. Well, I'm glad Joe started for me the controversy because we have a lot of controversial uh, stuff coming up. Well, this couldn't be any more controversial with that slide. So you, if you could just get off that slide, I'll be a lot happier. Well, maybe I should agitate you and keep going back to that slide. Don't. Uh, here's the, uh, the controller for the biomedicus, uh, Joe's favorite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, weight 55 pounds. <laughs> No, and that's it, because it, does, it has a battery. No, it, does, it is very cumbersome, I have to say that. Mm -hmm. But one thing I'll tell you, uh, there's a program or there's a, it was a meeting for a transplant that says every transplant program has to have an ECLS program uh, protocol. Mm -hmm. And the, the ones that were- You mean an ECPR? No, EC, ECLS, e ECLS, okay. Yes, put the, basically put the patient on pump. Right, okay. You have, you have a transplant, you code, you go on pump, no pondering, no journal club. Mm -hmm. And so do you agree on that? If you have a cardiac arrest. And you had a transplant. Like a, and you a had a transplant. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Sure. And so that's why I think. It buys you time. It's, a, it's, it's basically a bridge to decision. What the hell happened here? Is it, re is it reversible? And what are we going to do? But in the meantime, if you do all of that, as you said, hand wringing and polite contemplation and debate, the patient's going to be gone. I have to tell you, I am agreeing with that a lot. And then the controversy, do you know how many of our institutions have that in place? Without pondering. The ones with pondering, all of them. Without pondering, automatic, how many do have that in place? I don't know. Uh, zero. That's, that, okay. that's, that's unfortunate. I think that's, that surprises me. There is an institution in a country far, far away from here that automatically, you got to transplant your code, you got to be go going on pump. The Australians who are amazing in uh, advanced in medicine, if you had a transplant and you code, they do not call the code team, they call the ECLS team. The ECLS team comes with a cart that has a, a saw. They will, zip, they will zip your chest wide open and put you on central. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. the best cannulation. Absolutely. There's no question about that. Uh, and these guys, I have to tell you, I mean, I looked at their uh, stuff, they're amazing, their numbers are amazing. They'll come, zip your chest open, bedside, put you on pump. People think that's too violent. Joe has seen and I have seen opening chest, bad side, it's not that bad at all. You know, I'll tell you, if you have experienced surgeons with experienced nurses, it's gonna go very smoothly. Do you agree? I agree 100%. I mean, really, if you don't panic, just get it done and get it done immediately. Don't ponder the situation. If the patient is purple by the time you do that, you're doing a very bad job. Well, a lot of that, you know, time, look, I mean, we see it on the battlefield, right? They have the golden hour from injury on the battlefield to the, to the soldier gets to the field hospital. That, that every, every minute that goes by, if you can get them where within an hour, their chances of survival are much higher. Absolutely. If you can restore good circulation more quickly, it just is commonsensical almost to me, even though I think that you can probably have some pretty good CPR under the right circumstances with the right people and the right patient. There are always going to be some, some obstacles to really good CPR. But you can't beat putting the patient on artificial circulation and oxygenation, and it's a done deal. Now you know you're getting good perfusion, and now the rest of the body has an opportunity to survive, a much better opportunity. I'll tell you, and I really, I feel that's for any transplant patient, MCS patient, that's a solution. Ponder what went wrong, like Joe said. And at that point, I wish our pumps had continuous like feet reading. Oh, I wish they did too. I mean, that, I just wish we would check them. We don't even routinely check them. I think if they were continuous reading, Joe would be like the hemoglobin. You would really be following that and trending it. Yes, and that's what you should base your flow on. Absolutely. Because the first like, take 3D from somebody who just coded would be like crazy. I want to see a washout and follow it. Now, I think, of course, now you'll probably help. If I can, can I be as controversial as you? Oh, please, fire away. I'm ready. I think if a patient is in that kind of a situation, they're an extremist, they've coded, 
They've been crashed on to bypass. They have a grossly elevated lactate. I believe that patient should immediately have, once they get to a facility, not in the field, but a facility, immediately put them on CRRT integrated into the ECMO circuit to normalize everything and remove those uh, metabolites like lactate and also correct their I'm 100% base. believer of that. You need to go on CRT and wash all the... Because uh, you know, if you have to depend on the kidneys to do it, you know, the no, kidneys no, no, may no. be compromised. They might be, be don't injured. Don't wait for your urine. Do not wait for anything. Absolutely. Why do people do that, though, all the I time? I don't know, because they're Even scared. if you have urine, they, they, because the, the, you know, we're not doing it for... If that case, you're not doing it for fluid removal. You're, I know the kidney will do it, but we're asking a kidney that has been insulted to work even harder than it normally does. It just doesn't make sense to me, but it's, I have this argument with people all the time. I the think CRT just should be part me. of the recovery, like event, ECMO, CRT. I agree. Okay. I agree. We agree today. That's at least so shocking. Okay, now we're going to look at more stuff now. And John, I want you to comment right away on everything that you like or you don't like. Okay. Okay, what do you think of the Centra Mag by Thoratec for That's Mercy ECMO and transporting, remember? Um, I think it's for that purpose. It's uh, incredibly expensive and um, unnecessary for the short term. And that, when I say short term, I mean up to probably two weeks, maybe even longer um, with today's pumps. It's a very expensive pump. Now, if you're gonna be on it for months, I would say that's definitely the one that you would wanna use. Um, how about the, it can flow up to 10 liters? And you know, we live in Texas, people are very petite here. And well, the restriction is gonna be the cannula size. You, it, there's very few cannulas, there's very few people's arteries big enough to flow 10 liters because it's dependent on the size of the orifice of the cannula, the length of the tubing, all of those things are going to uh, contribute to the resistance to flow and therefore the line pressures. And of course, you're going to have increased shear forces, so you'll get, you know, more plasma-free hemoglobin or hemolysis secondary to it. I think it's a good pump for the very long term, for short term, I think it's overkill and way too expensive. And how about the, you don't feel that compactness uh, like uh, pays for it? That it's so compact? No. Okay. Con here's the console, easy to manage to be honest. I, I mean, I, it's very also light, you have to admit that. Mm -hmm. I think and the that, long battery life. Mm -hmm. I think that pump uh, is a very good pump for air transport. I think that again, it's comparatively very, very expensive. The circuit for each one of that box is somewhere between one hundred and twenty and one hundred and forty thousand dollars in that range, um, and the circuits for them range between twelve and fourteen thousand per circuit. Whereas a normal circuit with the same type of fiber that they have, which is a longer durability fiber, is about eighteen hundred to two thousand. So there's a big difference in cost and so I think that's something that you have to take into consideration now if you're going by helicopter you're going by fixed wing I think that is a the you that is a must-have that is a must-have but if you're a community-based hospital where you don't do that many of these you're not typically going to transport the patient somewhere. They're going to come get the patient. Absolutely. They'll bring their own system, they'll convert to theirs, and then they'll go. And converting is not, it's, it's I mean, it's never fun, but it's, uh, it's done, you know, routinely and safely. So I have to ask you, when you talk about your system, you have to let the audience know what is your system? Well, we use the Levanova platform, and uh, it, it's, it's, you know, decent size, it's not real small, but you can remove the battery and the control and get it between the patient's legs, so taking it on ambulance is pretty easy. So we use the Levanova system, I think it's the S3 they call it, um, and it's a platform where it has a cart so you can move the patient to, let's say, CT or somewhere else in the hospital you need to take them to cath lab or whatever it may be. So it has some portability to it, 
but it would be it would not be appropriate for any type of air transport. Why? You really have to too big. Too big. Okay. It's too big. It's too big and cumbersome. Yeah. That's a very simple that's what that was made for. And what's the cost of your system around? For the whole platform? Yes. The whole platform with maybe with cannulas and everything. Well for the whole plat for the for the hardware that you have to have like that, a pump and a battery and all that stuff, that's running about fifty to sixty thousand. And then the circuit depending on whether you use polypropylene fibers, which are more for short term, or you're using uh, polymethylpentene fibers, which is more for the long term, uh, they'll they have like about 30 day durability, plus or minus, just like the, the, the one from this company does. Um, that's about 1,800 to 2,000. The polypropylene one is about 1,000, whereas this is 13,000. That's a big difference in cost. And if you're a community hospital, you have to take that into consideration. Do you need it? Do you have to have this if you're going to keep the patient? And if the patient is going to be taken via transport, you're going to drive them there. That platform will work very well and very simply. If they're going to come get the patient with the helicopter, they're always going to bring their own system anyway. So it doesn't make any sense. Because when you take them to the receiving facility, even by air ambulance, we have to take that equipment back. So we have to convert them over to their system anyway, regardless of what system they're using. Because the tubing stays the same. Absolutely. It's the slice connector. Right, correct. That's fairly universal. Okay, I'll tell you, I love the Center Mac for one reason. I, you know, I enjoy riding the trains in Japan. Center Mac was developed about, like with the Japanese train idea in mind. If we can get that video going, it'd be great which is basically no touch policy of the uh, uh, rotator on the device itself. Because, I mean, and it's just by magnetic levitation forces. That's how the train in Japan was designed, and that's how the design of the company you made. I believe in thrombotic events during ECMO and bypass causes very catastrophic events. You know, that's what we used to call pump head, that's not pump head. That's thrombotic events happening during bypass. You think? To be honest with you, I do feel that. And if you do continuous TCD, you see it. And you know, one of our friends loves TCDs. And you think it's thrombotic? Yes, uh, like embolic thrombotic events. Things flying away from sheer forces. From the aorta? From the aorta, from blood contact with the, with the pump. You really believe that? I do believe that, I'm not gonna lie to you. That, uh, and that's why. Do we have the video that don't touch? Uh, the, uh, I don't think we have that video. But it is, there's a video that shows how the speed goes very fast. Maybe that's it. And it doesn't really touch, the, the bearings don't touch each other. Right. It's, it's magnetically yes. levitated. Right. And that's, I mean, again, I keep promoting that, and I'm and not that's Japan. A, that's a heat generation yeah, thing. I'm it not Japanese, that. but the train in Japan slides the weight that fast. Uh, because there's no touch, the friction slows the train. And that's why I look at that train and I learn from that that the friction from the blood with the, with the bearings mm -hmm. must cause a lot of thrombotic events. TCDs, TCDs, Joe. Should I report you to your friend? TCD. <laughs> TCD. Now, I believe in TCD. Well, what's TCD show you? Showing you these little flicks, flicks coming up from here. But they can't, TCD doesn't know, I don't think so. I don't think TCD can, can at least what I remember Dr. Garami telling me is that it cannot, selectively determine if it is particulate or gaseous. It's only seeing something. I agree with that, but the question is, like we have decided we're not going to have journal clubs and don't want a journal club. Mm -hmm. I want to, nothing, I don't want particular. I really afraid the, the thrombotic and bodic events. I'm scared of it. And I'll tell you, I started to see it on balloon pumps. I started to hate balloon pumps because of that. Every time the pump pulsates, you see the rush. You have to you anticoagulate get, the patient. We stopped anticoagulating uh, balloon pump patients in 1920. Why, <laughs> okay. Why, why Go, we have to say can that? we see this thing spinning around real fast? <laughs> While you're doing that, I've got to do something. I've got to do one thing. So just keep, keep, you keep talking. I'm watching. Okay, sir. Okay, we can stop the video. Go to the next slide then.
Are we able to? Yeah, yeah okay. Now, look at this system. Did you like the PLS system by Marquette? Um, I mean, it's okay. You know, it's okay. I mean, I, you know, I have an issue with a square oxygenator. I don't know anybody's blood vessels that are, that are square. I think um, maybe you. You might be square. No, mine are round. Are you sure? I'm square. Um, so, you know, a, flat, a, a, a square oxygenator to me, and from an engineering perspective, just doesn't make any sense. And if you study these oxygenators, you find that the corners, not unexpectedly, have very uh, 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 routine areas of stasis and stagnation. And that's where you're going to have increased thrombogenicity because of that lack of flow. And then you will have that problem of your oxygenator starting to fill with clot and then flaking them off into the, uh, through, the, through the arterial system. So I just don't think a, a square oxygenator makes sense. You can tell you why I don't like the system and you're gonna make fun of me. I feel like somebody's gonna kick that oxygenator, it's gonna fly off and the system is gonna fall apart. No, <laughs> okay? that, that's the least of the problems. I don't know, for some reason it's in my imagination that's what's gonna happen. That's what I'm gonna say. Now I, I can be somewhat clumsy. If, I, if we do your case, you're probably best to keep me out of the room so I don't trip because I could trip and fall. That could happen if they're using this one. Okay. Uh, absolutely. But this one, I don't really like it. I, 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 want I don't it. like it for other reasons, no. but, but oh. it's a good ox. I mean, it does work. It's FDA approved. A lot of things FDA approved, I don't agree with, but anyway, do you agree for this is why send the patient out and what kind of system to use? Uh, would you Let's agree see. with these points? What am I saying? So inlet suction pressure, management of, okay, why transport? Outlet pressure. I don't understand the. No, no, no. Phrase. I mean, how to manage the pump during transports? Um, well, you do have to worry about, about obviously, your, your access. You want to make sure you have good flow. It's not collapsing a lot of, around the vessel. Fluid balance is good. Um, you don't want over resistance to flow where your cannula may be up against the wall of the artery or whatever the case may be, if you're VA. Power failure is a huge concern, uh, but you have a hand crank, so you know you can do that. Can I ask you how many perfusionists problem. know how to hand crank? Can I, that's I mean, we all do. I think Everybody we, does. The, the more experienced ones are very good at it because they've dealt with it. That, that may be true, but I, I, I would say most, I, I would say the overwhelming majority of perfusionists, if, they would be able to hand crank. It's, it's, it's not a complicated maneuver. It's pretty simple. And they even make them now so you can't turn them the wrong direction. <laughs> it will only go one way. No comments. Yeah, I was going to say that, but you don't know who said it. Yes. Check what? My phone? Yeah. Oh. Should, we, should we stop? No, okay, so I'll tell you why I put the slide on. It's a segue for my next slides. I mean, why send the patient out, you know? I said, well, and how to send them out safely. You have to worry about uh, if you can have blood in the bus or in the transport uh, vehicle. Do you have CO2 clearance? How you may manage all that? Uh, blood thinners, how you gonna monitor the patient, power backup. And so I really could get concerned about safety a lot. The last time I sent a patient out, and I'm not gonna name the hospitals, I made sure to send the, a critical care nurse and a CRNA of the patient in the bus. And that worked out very safely. And that became our tra standard of transfer. With the perfusionist? Absolutely. Yeah, on ECMO. Uh, well, well, the perfusionist, like, there's no even mention. It has to be there. Yes. Yeah. Well, unless but, it's a specialist model. No, I'll tell you, I it. would be comfortable that with this situation. I would have to say, I need a perfusionist. You think a perfusionist? Okay, yeah, well, a critical care fair. nurse and a CRNA. And that worked out perfectly. It became our standard after that. So this is the slide that segue of a lot of other slides. See, well, how to manage equity, I mean, everybody knows that here. And who transports, we already covered that. Now, this is here where we start the controversy or why I ask all these questions. So, talk about equity and cumbersome. Poor Joe is in the ambulance over, trying to get in the corner, squeeze the equipment and the patient. You have to remember, you need the patient on the bus, you need the, the people, you need the equipment. And sometimes it's not an easy task. Do you agree, boss? I agree. Now, in fairness, that top right picture of me, okay, I look pretty good in there though, you know what, I look amazing, good. Amazing, like I you're do. really I good. like amazing. I didn't know I was that good looking. Um, but I, that was before 
You lost. I real no. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> before I realized that we could take all of that apart and do it like you see on the bottom picture, where I'm now sitting with Min and an ICU nurse Archie having a nice easy drive instead of that craziness because I figured out I could take that platform that I was talking about and put it down between the patient's legs and it made it very easy to do. So, you know, you live and you learn, right? Absolutely. Now, we're gonna, this was ground, the helicopter. I mean, I'll tell you, helicopter is not the easiest thing for transfer, do you agree? Agree. There's not much room there. Very hard to do. And if you ever went on a helicopter ride, you realize that. Unfortunately, I had the luck of going on a helicopter ride as a physician and as a patient. There's not much room. I mean, I was trying to look downstairs at the road, and the, if the paramedic says, Dr. Samir, what the hell are you looking at? And now, this is from one of my friends in Hamad Medical uh, Corporation in color, a Learjet, which is converted to an amazing transport vehicle. And I'm going to look at it. I'm very, we've got to be proud of other people, what they do. We are advanced. I do feel other people are more advanced than we are. They have the capabilities that we think we all have, but I'll tell you, I'm very proud of the, their work. They do amazing work. They also have a great ECLS program. You code, you get cannulated. No playing mm -hmm. around. And we're gonna show some of those pictures. This is how the ramp, and we can play those videos whenever we're ready, once we come to that. This is the loading ramp, how to get the patient. And they, they adapted the plane like that to load the patients smoothly. No issues, no patient, like nobody hurting themselves, and the patient got in smoothly. And I'll tell you, when you look at it, this patient sliding in with all these people on the bottom, and they have a harmonious team. They drill it about a few times a year. And they do ECMO dot borders. They transfer between different countries, mm -hmm. not in different regions. So you can call them from one of the countries. I have a patient needs to come to you guys. They will send the Learjet with the team, and we'll look at the team later. And it's an amazing job they do. Again, this is not my own institution. This is a friend who has shared these videos with me, and I really appreciate Dr. Ibrahim. He's a giant. And there's a meeting right now in South Africa where all this data being presented in. Yeah, you told me about him. Yes. In fact, he, we've he been trying to get him on the program. Today he's presenting in South Africa, which I like you, Joe. I wish I was there with him, okay? But he can, he can be in South Africa because we have the technology to do it with Skype, and he can come in, and we can feed him, and he could have been here with us. And he's present, but he's presenting, unfortunately, right now. And this was a patient who was transferred from Sudan to Qatar. And if you look at the geography, Sudan and Qatar are not that close. And so and I'll show you how that plane is equipped. And I'm not a manufacturer or a speaker for the company. I'm just saying how this plane is equipped and they made it like a little hospital. So the thought that went behind it all about the safe things we talk about went through that. And I think that what has it, we have it here in the US more is the US military is amazing at those kind of transfer from land shawl. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you've seen that, Joe. Yes. So I mean, this is a much smaller scale and the civilian from different countries. And you just think, like, I mean, have we, should we send a plane to Canada to pick up a patient? It's something, and Canada is much closer to us. Sudan is not close at all to color. No, and I think we're going to see more and more of that, I think, as time goes on. Absolutely. Coronavirus, all these people stuck on the ship. I mean, you need to evacuate them to a center that can handle that. That, that can handle ECMO patients on event manager of critical care physicians. I mean, there were two of them that died. They got diagnosed. Absolutely. They were on the ship, and they ended up dying. The problem is not one country is going to have enough equipment to put these patients on ECMO. I'm sure Joe remembers during the SARS time. Everybody, he was freaking out. What, what the, most hospitals did, they took pumps apart, and they had to decrease their cardiac surgery cases. H1N1, too. Absolutely. That was the big, that was the big issue. And, uh, no, we were actually... I mean, actually we were called out here for diversion from the med center they couldn't take any more patients they were so overloaded and they were filtering them out here absolutely and there was a backup plan to have one of the hospitals out here like the h1n1 hospital again i'm very i may look at the pump like joe said between the patient's legs safely i'm learning a lot from them they have a track that they roll the patient uh, there I mean, there was a lot of thought that went into this situation. We're not talking about how fancy the plane is. We'll talk about that later. We'll see the lodge for the doctors. 
finally the docs are getting appreciated. So I'll tell you, and they're loading the patient with the, with the bed into, into the, the Leo. Remember, this is not a C1, C-130 carrier. This is a Leo jet. Mm -hmm. So, I mean. Yeah, so set up like a, set up like a, a, a pretty good size ambulance. I mean, that's exactly. A, that is a. Uh, and they, they encourage the family to come with the patient. And uh, I mean, the, they, they actually to bring the, uh, the family with the patient. The family was very gracious enough to agree for us to televise these videos. So I want to thank the families. I want to thank Dr. Ibrahim again. And I will just want to show you, hopefully it will come a little later, the outlets of the wall, the demature auction, uh, electric. So you want to say, Joe, which system they used? I'm not going to let you say it. Here. Which oh. system to use in this case? No, they use. They use. Oh, I think they're. I think what they're using is an uh, is an appropriate system for what they're doing. Absolutely. So it's we, the we smallest. It's very. Of course. I mean, I think that it has excellent, excellent utility in this setting. It's the right thing to do. So even you, if it's a square oxygenator. But regardless of that, the platform is designed for this purpose. And even with that, they put the pump, they put, uh, they put the console and everything and between the patient's legs, the safest way I learned that. Because you can always hold the patient's legs together and they would hold everything together. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you again, this was a, this was a VV ECMO, you know, again. And they said that they took the patient and they're transferring him. I just want to show a little more. Hopefully you can advance the video a little more. Here's what I wanted to show. Outlets in the wall for mm -hmm. everything. Okay, that's oxygen, the, air. air. Everything. Uh, electric, oxygen, air, what we talked about. Everything. Yes. Everything. And then there's another side is computers for the physician to document even in flight. Okay, I mean, that's amazing to me. I have to say that. Why don't we have this? We can have the Joey. <laughs> yeah, my, my, my airplane? Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Look, again. I'll tell you why we don't have that, Joe. You can ask that controversy. I don't want to. I yeah, don't why, don't we, why don't we? And here's have the, it. Dr. Oh, Ibrahim, Dr. Ibrahim. And I want to thank him. Ibrahim. We have a little, yeah, Ibrahim. And he's a little lounge for the doctors, so the doctors don't have to suffer through this flight. They can get something to eat and relax while the patient is being transferred. And they're keeping an eye on the patient. And I think that's the right way to do things, to be honest with you. We have to uh, appreciate and respect our medical personnel. And so I'll tell you. Really, uh, this, uh, this uh, made me feel ECMO without borders. We can do this anywhere. And if they had telemetric, maybe they could have watched the patient over, the, over Sudan, but Sudan had no capability of taking care of this patient. Mm -hmm. So they asked the patient to be flown out. Mm -hmm. Now, this is where it gets tricky, for example. And it's a harsh reality. Well, let me let you finish. And we'll, 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 no. Let me let you finish. Because well, I here's think the advantage of transporting, and you can come and right there. You have board certified critical care physicians they're going to. They have CVHD, which is their ECLS Very team. Very important. Very important. Uh, yeah. ECLS team, which is, knows how to manage the situation. The guidelines, which is very important. Anticoagulation, which we really haven't talked about that much. I'm a big believer in, especially in these long journeys. Uh, give a bolus of heparin before you leave. And then if you're flowing high enough, you really don't have to be crazy about the anticoagulation level. Do you agree or no? If you're flowing high enough. Yeah, if you're flowing high enough, but I don't necessarily think I like the idea of giving them a big bolus because no, not you know, a big it's, bolus. I'm talking about five thousand units. I don't think that's enough. If it's I don't Come think on, that's now, enough. Make up your mind, Joe. Enough no, I'd rather gonna... just put them on a drip. I'd rather give them five thousand bolus and then put them on a drip of uh, let's say a thousand an hour. Okay. That's what I would do. How long is the flight? This flight this flight is a five, six hour flight. Yeah, I'd put them on a drip. Okay, I would give them a bolus of 5,000, maybe even 10,000, and then 1,000 an hour, depending if on the you, weight of the patient. If you're five, six liters, you're not confident? No. Okay, I'm going to have one of, a couple of my surgeons find you. A couple of the one from New York, one from Florida. Okay. I'll find you. Now, one, one uh, term I learned here, which I'm, you know, I'm not sure you've seen that term before, ECMO circuit emergency response team. You like that term? I do. I like Me it. Is that, is that a new one? Did you come up with it? No, sir. No. no, I'm not that smart. I promise you. ECMO circuit emergency response. Yeah. That so really that would be a specialist model, but you have 
somebody who is overseeing everything, and when there's a problem, he's the, the he or she is on that team. Absolutely. Or you basically, I think the critical care physician, if there's a problem, should call the response team mm -hmm. and escalate as further needed to the surgeons if that's needed. To right. So it could be a circuit issue where the oxygenator is failing, needs to be changed immediately to a question of why are we having uh, chattering in the line and access issues. Where is the cannula? Whatever. Cannula is it a cannula position? That would be a surgeon. Then you'd have to escalate it up from there, right? And again, why are we sending the patients out nitric oxide? We forget about nitric oxide. You know how many, you know many hospitals don't have nitric oxide? But can I tell you something? Do you know, Do you know how many any, don't have it? I'm not going to name the company. There's a new company for nitric oxide, which is totally different, cheaper than before. And they actually have con uh, contracts where you can use as much as you want same price hmm. so that is good that's pretty i think good. that i mean as long as we've been talking about nitric oxide and the benefits of it especially for pulmonary hypertension rv failure this kind of thing as much as we talk about it for years years and years and years and years that it's not ubiquitous i want i want to inhale nitric oxide on the side i think it's going to be good for my lungs but i'll tell you i think right now nitric is going to it's, it's a big deal and you should transfer your patient to an ecmo center which has nitric i agree yeah you can maybe get them weaned off of ECMO, which would be much better. Uh, absolutely. Now we also have to talk about the safety, safety risk, and you have to really do this every day. You cannot do it once in a lifetime, and that, that's it. The transport vehicles available, and I'll tell you, in the city of Houston, and Joe knows there's not the many transport vehicles available that can handle that situation. And it's a drama when Joe wants to transfer a patient from one place to the other. We and have he, to tell him, bring the big bus. Exactly. Do not bring some little ambulance. You got to bring the big one, the big box. And, you know, climate issues, obviously, fly or ground. There's always a controversy in transplant or these kind of situations. International transfer, I said, act without boundaries. We have to forget about boundaries. We're here to help patients. Political issues, drama issues, that's not the issue. Take care of the patient. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really want to thank everyone. I want you to realize that I think ECMO across borders is the, the, the thing for us. We should not be limited where you are. Let's say if you're visiting a country and you're on vacation, you drop dead. Do you want us to save you or leave with you there because you're in a different country? You have to think about yourself when making rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. So when politicians are making rules and drawing lines, they have to think about that. Yes, I would agree with that too. I think that that's absolutely true. So, so let's become controversial. We can open the phone lines well. too if you want. So you want to open the phones, uh, David? Thanks, bud. Um, so I think the ECMO without international borders makes sense. And I think there's a lot of people, let's just say hypothetically in the Bahamas, uh, possibly down in the, you know, further down in the Caribbean, uh, Central America, um, that would benefit tremendously from being able to be brought here to the United States and treated here. But of course, are we talking about our citizens who are insured, who need to be repatriated for this care, do they have that expertise there to at least get it started? Um, and then, you know, of course, if you have a patient who, so, so cost is an issue, it can't be avoided, and we may as well have the discussion. Um, and that sounds, unfortunately, it sounds inhumane, but it is a harsh reality of the world we live in. It doesn't matter where you are, it's the same problem everywhere. Canada is not going to just start taking people from uh, another country because they have the capability because they would bankrupt the country. So that's a problem. And then knowing, you know, whether or not the patient, let's say, was a uh, 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 they had a cardiac arrest. Was the CPR good? Is this patient viable? Do did they have enough brain protection? You have to check. You have to have a neuro consult before you bring any patient under any circumstances from wherever they are to here. You have to determine the patient's viability before you accept the transfer like that. I'll tell you what I feel about that, that we have done that. I would say do a virtual, now everything for me is about virtual. Do a virtual medical review board. Mm -hmm. And the medical review board, as a body for somebody from every discipline, 
goes through ever, everything. So you have to look at the virtual and medical review board that you can do on FaceTime if you cannot, don't have the capability. So you can do that and discuss and decide to accept the patient or not. I do feel that all the hospitals in some of these countries are able to put patients on ECMO, but are not able to do with them whatever. They, like this patient was put on ECMO before arrival. They, were with the, they did not go put them on ECMO. Right. So, they, so the patient's on ECMO already. The question is, could they handle that? They don't have the capabilities. They don't have an exit strategy. They don't have MCS. They don't have CVHD. They don't have uh, ventilator expertise from critical care physician. So I think, I mean, there has to be a program where the physicians here can manage those patients pre-transfer, get them optimized as much as they can for the ride, and then come to a center where there can be an exit strategy. But the evaluation of this patient should be done with a virtual MRV, mm -hmm. so like any other patient would be done here. Yeah, I would agree. I would agree. I think you have to do that. So you know, and and uh, being cautious to not um, say too much, but enough. We're very fortunate where we are out here in this community. So we're in the northern Houston, Houston area. We have ECMO capability. Uh, at all of the hospitals, but not far from here, not far, they have no capability of providing that. And for patients, and I know hospitals in other states where there's not an ECMO center within 200 miles. So when you end up in that hospital, it almost becomes just simply the luck of the draw. Did you, by happenstance, end up at a place that can do this and has that expertise? And should it be, again, kind of like going back to the nitric oxide thing, should it be a requirement that a hospital be able to put, a, when I say a hospital, a hospital that would have the appropriate, like, you're not gonna take a cardiac arrest patient to a surgery center, everybody knows that. But if you have an active emergency room that sees patients that come in with ACS, for example, that you should have emergency ECLS capability. Should that be a requirement? I'll tell you, what, that I don't agree with should be a requirement, but I think right now we fly all over the place to get organs. Some of these or places where you get organs are in small hospitals. We should be able to fly our ECMO team to so these hospitals, put the patient on ECMO, and then bring it to the, our own center. But what if they come in? What if they come in PEA? That's what they're the, going to do CPR on them until we can get there. No, probably not. Probably not. And that's what you have. If you have that, then you. I mean, there's that. We have to accept that at some point. But 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 that's by virtue of going. He, I mean, that's that's the difference in the ambulance turning right and turning left. That, that's the issue. That's yeah. the problem that I have. But can I ask you something? Is the patient doesn't know. Does, every, the patient, doesn't does know. every patient coming in PA in a big medical center going to go on ECMO? No. No. If it's, it's gonna appropriate. Be, it's going to be a decision made virtually. But they still have the ability to make the decision. It's not my I, point. I understand. But I mean, unfortunately. You hate it when I do that. See? No, but there's the some way I, the, way, the way I think is everybody should have this. I think that way. Now, See, I think it's unrealistic financially. It's, not, realistic. No, it's, it's not. not. It's not realistic financially. I understand that. But, you know, I've, I know of patients who were, this kid was 25 years old. It was a hospital in a different state. I won't say who, where, what state or where it was. 25 years old. It was during H1N1. Had ARDS secondary to it. They didn't have ECMO capability. I knew that patient would be, could be 25 years old, could have been saved on for, it, were it not for, if you had ECMO, they, they, they beat him and beat him and beat him with the vent until his lungs finally turned to mush and he ended up passing. But I'm gonna, That's wrong. But I can tell you something, I'm gonna be controversial back. ARDS did not develop in the, in the one hour. That was went on for days. You know of that? course. Yeah. Yes, I so agree with that too. So they had the chance. They had the chance uh, leading up to this situation. We always talked in our panels. When you think of ECMO, call for it. When you think of ECMO, don't ponder. Call for it. Well, what do you say to the people who say ECMO uh, doesn't doesn't save anybody? 
What about the people that uh, take the CESAR trial and say that it was a poorly designed trial, it, uh, the data's wrong, because that shows 60% survivability for VV ECMO for ARDS, and uh, I don't, you know, they don't believe, they basically take it, tear it up, throw it out, say I don't believe it, and yeah, I'm not gonna use ECMO. I think the answer to that is two answers. The new data that's gonna be published, is gonna blow them out of the water, especially with new diseases like coronavirus, and the, what's going on with the flu, you know, you know how many deaths from the flu this year? Probably quite a few. 10,000. 10,000, yeah. Yeah, we think Corona is bad. The regular flu is 10,000. So we should, we're ignoring these numbers. Yeah, and, and that's enough, that is an issue because everybody's talking about, you know, what is it, COVID-19, coronavirus, whatever you want to call it, making a big deal out of it. And it's a big deal. I'm not saying it's not a big deal. It's a big, scary deal. But... You know, we have this other problem that's a lot more common. That we can protect ourselves by just getting vaccine. By anyway, I'll tell you, you know, those numbers are gonna blow everything out of the water. And you have to think of yourself, if you had the flu, do you really think, I mean, you don't wanna go in ECMO or not? So all these naysayers have to look at that. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's something that the flu is supportive care for a few days, you should recover okay. You should, I agree, and I've seen it. Absolutely. I've seen it, but there are still those people who will say, you put him on ECMO, he didn't really need to be on ECMO, that patient would have done fine without it. There are those people that will say that. Okay, I'm gonna talk about myself. If I do, if don't put me on ECMO if I'm far gone, but put me on ECMO early. Don't wait to beat me up with the vent and pressers, and then put me on ECMO, I'm gonna fail for sure. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, I agree. And then they do put the, those very same naysayers will do that, cause all kinds of barotrauma to the lung, cause all kinds of perfusion deficits to your, to, your, to your peripheral microcirculation, brain, heart, liver, everything else, then put you on ECMO at the, last, at the very end, and then you don't survive, and they say, see, the ECMO doesn't work. I, I, look, you, you, you can't tell me you have never seen that happen. Well, I, for sure, I've seen that happen, and that's why I, I'm a big advocate. You think of ECMO, do it. And that's why I believe in ECLS for trans mm -hmm. transplant patients. Again, this is a hospital I talk about. The nurses are trained. Uh, transplant patients don't call the co-team, call the ECMO team. Mm -hmm. ECMO team comes, there's no even discussion. Okay, this patient was a transplant. Can you relate either preferably or Australia, zip the chest can relate centrally, put them on ECMO, and then ponder later. Was it a PE, you know, and all this, or a QT, all these things that we come up to with and then decide to go from there. Yeah, and I those patients recover that. and they get decannulated much earlier. Yes, especially and they just had a transplant. I mean, you know, I mean, it, 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 they should be fine. It's usually going to be something that is either fixable or convert them to a long-term bad. Maybe they had some kind of, you know, graft failure that just occurred for some reason, um, and they may benefit from another graft. I'll tell you, me and one of my close friends, uh, we uh, something like that. Put the patient on ACMO, list of 1A, and then figure out the solution to make it. Mm -hmm. If the patient recovered, then you can take the listing off. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Find what the, what the problem is. But don't wait, ponder. Like one of my good cardiologists say, don't have a journal club. Journal club with somebody's life is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. For, for me, decide or don't decide. Do it or don't do it. Exactly. Yeah, don't wait. No. The longer you wait, the less chance you have to survive. Absolutely. You're just wasting somebody's brain kidneys. I thought Stephanie was going to call. Can you, uh, oh no, she's doing a case, I forgot. She's doing a heart, she can't call. She was gonna call. Okay, so you wanna, do you guys wanna take another five minute break before I wrap up with mine? Yeah, we can do, you wanna be five or seven? Seven, seven minutes, okay, 10 minute. 10 minute break, everybody. We'll take 10 minutes and uh, we'll see you right back. I've got a real interesting talk about the soul and we're gonna bring Tracy Howeth back and she's going to participate in this panel discussion. I think you're going to find it very interesting. Do you have I'm a going soul? To talk up. <laughs> that hurt. Uh, uh, gonna, <laughs> we're going to talk about some ancient Egyptian beliefs, and it's going to be a little lighthearted. It's not going to be as intense as this, but hope. Oh, got a caller. Who called? You have to answer it. Hello, you're on the air. Hello? Oh, that Hello? Hurt. Hello? Hey, you're on the air. Who's this? Hey, it's Stephanie. Hey, How Stephanie, I was just talking about you. 
You're, Stephanie, your, gr your girlfriend I was, I was called. I going to call in, but you guys had so much to say. I thought you were doing great on your own. Thank you. Stephanie, where are you? I missed you here. <laughs> oh, I have just pulled into the hospital. I am about to start a pericardial window. Good luck, Stephanie. I hope it's a simple miss, window. Thank with, you. With no holes in the heart. I miss... Uh, <laughs> no holes. Uh, I appreciate your talk, guys. And um, I guess... Uh, my thoughts, r real quickly, are um, it doesn't really matter, I think, to me what the circuit design is. I mean, we can always start working on improving that as well. Um, we just need to focus on, for transport, the weight of the pump in our footprint. So um, the way we've, we still, we're okay with um, our SCPC pump, but I would like to have something that was cost effective, but also um, weighed a little less. And then I've also done, I think we've uh, done a good job on decreasing footprint by doing things like um, now we like, um, I don't know if you guys will agree with this, but we lay the oxygenator on the patient and tape it to them so that we don't have the hardware for that and the extra weight. A um, couple of things I think also that would be beneficial that we don't do, and I just want your thoughts on it. Um, I think we should create a, a go bag so that when it's time to transport, we have everything we need and we're not thinking last minute, like what should we take with us? Um, and then also, I just am wondering what you guys think about, we don't actually usually bring a backup circuit and should we be doing that? Or hmm. do you think with an hour transport, that would just be, if something really catastrophic happened, would we be able to get another circuit up and running, you know? I think a go back is amazing. That's an amazing idea. That's the other circuit. I'll let Joe answer that. I don't, I don't, okay. I, I don't think that, I don't think I would even want to try to change a circuit in a in an ambulance on I, her. I think I uh, agree with that. It would be too cumbersome and there's yeah. so It would be a come. nightmare. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yes, I, I, I don't. But are I don't. we liable, you know, for if we don't bring one and not for if something breaks, you know, that we don't try? This is true, but if something breaks, my, my suspicion is, is that, I, you know, there's an old saying, the best way to get yourself out of trouble is to not get in trouble in the first place. And so I would Agreed, say... Agreed, 100%. Uh, yeah, I would say don't break anything. Um, because I don't think it's, I don't, I, if something was that bad, I, I don't think there'd be enough space and time, um, and organization to be able to do it. I think it'd be just a disaster. I think either way it'd be it, a disaster. It yeah. I think I, it, I was just throwing it out there. But between, I think the go you know, bag, how can we do better? the go bag makes a lot of sense. I like that idea. You Absolutely. like that idea too. Absolutely. And I don't think, I think we could do a I better like job with that. Have that already prepared. Right. Yes. Agreed. Okay, guys, I'm walking in. So you're doing a great good job. Good luck, man. Thank you. Have fun. Thank you. Have bye. a good day. All right. Bye. Oh, good. So she called so because she loves you. Thank you. Okay, I she feel. wanted to be here, but she knew she had this case that she had to do and she couldn't be here. Absolutely. Okay, so we're going to take the 10 minute break and then we're going to come back with me, your wonderful, terrific host, Joe Basha, Dr. Samir, and Tracy Howitz. She's on deck waiting to come up. So, 10 minutes. The point of care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary. As we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community, the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization. Many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post-procedure, so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay. 
they will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, and the faster you can, you can act on it. The process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Mixed cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mixed dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the wrap venous cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? 
Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500. And then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today. Okay, and welcome back everyone. We're gonna uh, get to the final part of this and I think you've all met before, but I wanna reintroduce Tracy Nicole Howitt. She is a licensed baccalaureate social worker. Yes. I got it right this time, I'm proud <laughs> of myself. That's a mouthful. Um, and uh, Tracy, of course, is a well-recognized uh, leader in uh, handling children and youth risk behavior, mental illness issues, or mental health issues, I guess would be a more appropriate term, right? Um, and although you've done a lot, um, come from the University of Texas in Austin, and although retired, you're still very active in your field, Yes, uh, helping both the youth and families. You consult and support parents and schools giving presentations, which you gave an excellent presentation the last program that we did on uh, on vaping in the schools. Oh, we were amazed. We were truly amazed. Actually, it was so Tracy good. Actually, Tracy stunned everyone with her data and statistics. We got a lot of comments on LinkedIn about the statistics. They could not believe it. And Tracy did an amazing job. Everybody appreciated the knowledge that you gave us. Thank Absolutely. You so, thank 100 you very much for that. I'm 100 percent agree. In fact, I was telling you, just so you know, uh, let me tell you what it is. Uh, and uh, her husband Clinton is in the audience. Can you please mark off April, uh, April 23rd? Um, uh, we need a talk on, it's a Thursday, on common youth behaviors with serious societal, societal implications. 
So, and I'll give you this. I'll okay. give you the title, <laughs> but uh, if it works for you, we may have to tailor it. But uh, but we really want you to come back because you really, it was a great talk that you gave. Thank but you. With that said, um, going back to continuing to introduce Tracy, um, you are a board member and supporter of the Hands of Justice. Yes. Uh, maybe you can tell us a little more about that, but you're also in, uh, inspiring human trafficking awareness educator, and uh, you work with a nonprofit agency uh, based here in Montgomery County. So maybe you could talk a little more about Hands of Justice. Hands of Justice, I'm extremely honored to be a part of. Um, Rebecca Carey is their founder and I was honored to be asked to be on her advisory board and she and I often give presentations together. Rebecca herself is a domestic human trafficking um, survivor. Really? Uh, yes, and uh, she is very brave in telling her story when we give presentations. Um, hmm. And our goal is not only to provide awareness and education to the community on how prevalent it really is in the Houston area, um, but also to work with rescued women and men, um, which unfortunately is a lot more common than you would think here in Texas. Um, we also provide scholarships to rescued individuals. They have to apply um, if they are interested in going back to college. Once we res help rescue them, and when I say help rescue, once the police rescue, and we help get them into homes, safety you, homes. You do the transition. You do Correct. from rescue by law enforcement Correct. to then the integration back into society. Correct. And we offer scholarships for those students that are willing to, um, are wanting to go back to school, to college. Uh, we've had several graduate. We've given out several scholarships uh, just in January to actually to young men. Um, wow. So it's, it's, I mean, when you say this is more common than you think, how common is it really? It's ranking up there as, um, and I don't want to give you an exact number because it changes so frequently, and I, I think that can be very scary if you don't understand, don't understand why it's increasing so rapidly. Part of the reason is because we are so aware. We are becoming more aware. Yeah. People are becoming more aware. So in our field, we don't necessarily think rising numbers are necessarily evil and bad, but it also means that people are becoming more aware. So it's not necessarily indicative of the number of occasions this occurs is more frequent. It's that we're finding out about it. So, but we don't necessarily know where the where the 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 top is. If you're still finding, you know, more of it, you, then it's 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 it is occurring X percentage. Let's just give assign a number to it. We don't know what that number is. However, we're here and it's still rising. It's rising and Rebecca has the most concrete numbers and I should know that off the top of my head so I apologize, I'll no, get back with fine. you on I that. Mean, it's, um, it's, I kind of caught you off guard with the question. No, 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 anyway. that's fine. Uh, but Houston, the reason Houston is so, it's so prevalent in Houston, we have two international airports, we have a ship channel, and we have I-10 that runs from coast to coast and it goes straight through Texas. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of ways to infiltrate trafficking into our state. Mm -hmm. yeah, very interesting. Kind of scary. It is interesting. So it's safe to say, well, Dr. Samir is Catholic, for those mm -hmm. of you who don't know, and are you Catholic as well? I'm Christian, non-denominational Christian. Christian. Non-denominational yes. Christian, okay. And so, you know, I am somewhere in this spiritual realm, and this is going to be a little provocative, perhaps. Uh, it's a little more lighthearted. But I think in our industries, whether it be in the medical industry or whether it be in, no, it is the medical industry, the mental health industry, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of times when we sort of consider and think about this, like, it, do we have a soul? And if we do have a soul, if you believe we have a soul, where is that soul? Right. So I, I sort of looked at where the search for the residence of the soul, where does it actually lie? And I know you have some good thoughts on this. I'm looking <laughs> forward to a provocative debate and discussion afterwards. So where's the clicker? Oh, can I borrow the clicker? Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. <laughs> okay, so going back to ancient Egyptian times, Dr. Samir is both Catholic and Egyptian. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, in fact, uh, in fact, I think your like your like your your grandfather was was one of the pharaohs. Is that true? Yeah, last time I checked. Last yeah. time you checked. Yes. So, in in ancient Egyptian times, the belief was that the soul resided in the heart. In fact, upon death, if you were part of the the upper echelon class, because not everybody got the same treatment, okay, right. you had to have money. Um, but the only organ in the body that was preserved was the heart. The brain was sucked out, the guts were taken out, and they were put into these uh, capic jars and put in with the tomb of the dead in order to be used later for the afterlife. But the heart was preserved. Okay. And a soul was judged by the feather of truth. So when you died, you ended up going to the hall of, the hall of truth and the heart was handed over to Anubis, who was the god of the afterlife. And he placed it on a great scale, and they weighed it against the white feather of Mott, who was the goddess of harmony, justice, and truth. If the soul, if the heart was lighter than the feather, you were admitted to the kingdom of heaven. However, if you perform bad deeds, <laughs> anything like that, you just weren't a good person, then the heart was heavier than the feather and it was immediately thrown to the floor and devoured by a menti, the god who had a face of a crocodile, the front of a leopard, and the back of a rhinoceros. I'm going to stay quiet to the end because I have a lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a side picture, side view of Dr. Samir? Please, you know. So, yeah. for the Egyptians, the, <laughs> a fate worse than death itself was non-existence. And that's what would happen. So, you had to do good deeds because you had to have a light heart. But the Egyptians could buy good deeds. They could get people to do good deeds for them if they had money. There was also the Book of the Dead. Now, Egyptians are really good business people. I know you don't think they are, but they're really good business people. And the Book of the Dead had various different spells and directions in it to help you, guide you through the afterlife because there was always these little pitfalls and different little traps that could occur. But the problem was you had to buy the book. You see, it wasn't given free. Not like you go to the hotel and you open up the drawer and there's a Gideon's Bible. See, they weren't free. The Book of the Dead cost you money. All right, so, oh, there. I forgot to change that slide. So, there's a copy of the Book of the Dead. By the end of the 5th century BC, there were still questions whether the heart or the brain was in fact the seat of intelligence and it remained unresolved in Western medicine. But by 460, I'm sorry, to 370 BC, Hippocrates decided that, okay, the soul is in the brain, in the mind. And he has his saying there, you can read. Mm -hmm. Plato, also about the same time, the soul of man is immortal and imperishable. So clearly they're not thinking it's just in the heart because that's still perishable. And this is so interesting that in 1485 to 1487, somewhere in that way, in that time frame, Leonardo da Vinci was the first person to pith a frog. <laughs> now he goes on to write, this is a diagram of him doing that. When he penetrated the medulla oblongata with a needle, the frog immediately died. Prior to that, and he writes it because he did it, the frog lived 
without its skin, without its organs, even with the head amputated, the frog would still live. But you stick a needle into that spot, they die instantly. So he concluded from that, that that in fact is the residence of the soul. And then you have the atheists. They exist too. One of the proofs, as Mark Twain said, of the immortality of the soul is that myriads have believed it. They also believe the world was flat. Clearly we know it's not. I didn't know Mark Twain was an atheist until I read this. Did you? I learned it in college. You did? Yes. <laughs> I skipped that class. Uh, that was a good answer, Tracy. I love it. <laughs> That's what <laughs> she's saying. You did not learn anything in college. That's what she's saying. Well, maybe I just paid attention in that class. That would be good. I was either sleeping or I was daydreaming, one or the other. So I didn't know that. So in 1981, now this is where it gets really weird. Okay. This is a physician. How far medicine has come in, I mean, it wasn't even a hundred years. I mean, by 1940 or 50, this would have never happened. But this is a physician, Duncan McDougall. He took six dying patients, dying of tuberculosis. And he actually published this work that he did in 1907 in the American Society for Physical Research, a really good journal at the time. But the, he tested four out of six patients, and I'm going to show you the actual article or the text of it. And only, only four of the six lost weight, but he concluded that the soul weighed 21.3 grams. Wow. So let's look at okay. his study. Wow. I'm going to read it to you because it's just fun. My first subject was a man dying of tuberculosis. It seemed to me best to select a patient dying with a disease that produces great exhaustion, the death occurring with little or no muscular movement, because in such a case, the beam could be kept more perfectly balanced, at balance rather, and any loss occurring readily noted. The patient was under observation for three hours and 40 minutes before death, lying on a bed arranged on a light framework built upon very delicately balanced platform beam scales. The patient's comfort was looked after in every way. Although he was practically moribund when placed upon the bed, he lost weight slowly at the, as, at the rate of one ounce per hour due to evaporation of moisture in respiration and evaporation of sweat. During all three hours and 40 minutes, I kept the beam and slightly above balance near the upper limiting bar in order to make the test more decisive if it should come, it being death. At the end of three hours and 40 minutes, he expired. And suddenly, coincident with death, the beam end dropped with an audible stroke, hitting against the lower limiting bar and remaining there with no rebound. The loss was ascertained to be three-fourths of an ounce. He found the soul in six patients to weigh between 0 0.5 and 1.5 ounces. I am ready for the answer. I'm very concerned about medicine from 1901. Can I tell you one thing? I want to understand how I would like to get a level of THC on that doctor. <laughs> okay. There you they go. They didn't have edibles back then. Uh, it does not the matter. brownies. Inhaling, inhaling <laughs> is not good sometimes, as yeah. Bill Clinton said. That's so, a remarkable yeah. study yes. that was published. That was published in, in a journal. Again, again, the Journal of Medical BS, like we talked about before. That's right. <laughs> so, some ap apocryphal stories, which are stories that probably aren't true, but they're interesting. So this heart surgeon supposedly reported to someone that when he removed a, the recipient's heart or the failed heart, he felt all of his life force energy being drained. But then when he would put the donor heart in, he would feel alive. He got a spark. He felt the energy of it. You know, I don't know. Have you ever heard that before? No, but I would believe that in one thing, that you're saving a patient's life. So you're getting an energy rush from that. But what about the, the other? Uh, that's THC again. And again, <laughs> at the cost of whom? Because if the soul resides in the heart, 
is that person, which is really my point to the whole thing, does that person then has a transplanted soul? However, that's okay. We can talk about that later. There's also a, another story, apocryphal in nature, of a psychologist whose wife had a heart transplant. And he regrettably just felt like his wife was just gone, as if a long, she lost her soul but had another's. I don't really believe it, but it's a story. So the soul is the core of your being. Now this is Deepak Chopra, contemporary uh, author and alternative medicine uh, uh, type of guy or advocate. It is, a, it is eternal. It doesn't exist in space time. It's a field of infinite possibilities, infinite creativity. It's your internal reference point with which you should always be in touch. Now we're getting a little more philosophical. You know, it doesn't exist in space and time. It's not in your heart, it's not in your brain. But where is it? Where is it? It doesn't exist in space and time, so where is it? And I understand infinite possibilities. So this neurosurgeon, he wrote an article, which I really recommend. You can look it up uh, with his name. Treatment of diseases by the brain by drugs or surgery necessitates an understanding of its structure and functions. Philosophical neurosurgeons soon become, soon encounter difficulties when localizing the abstract concept of a mind and soul within what is a very tangible 1300 gram organ containing 100 billion neurons. And he's British, so that's not misspelled. That's just how they write it. Hippocrates, as I said earlier, had also focused attention on the brain as the seat of the mind. Then there's Phineas Gage. I didn't know who Phineas Gage was. Apparently this is, a, this is a, 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 a case that many neurosurgeons are usually taught as they're going through their, their residencies and fellowships. But in 1848, he was a railway foreman. He was well recognized by everybody, liked by all, trustworthy, hardworking, dependable, the whole thing. He sustained a penetrating head injury. He lost little intellectual capacity. However, his personality changed far for the worse. He became specious, he became, uh, he, he was prone to vulgarity. He became irresponsible, capricious, mm -hmm. and he just became a horrible person. Still had all of the skill and capability, and, and knowledge, intellect, but he became a horrible person. In fact, so much so, the company had to fire him. They had to let him go and get rid of his job. Now, he went on to do other things and eventually became better, more manageable with whatever happened to him. But if the mind, if the brain is the seat of the soul and you have an injury to the brain, do you then also have an injury to your soul? And one would argue that, you know, how many times have we heard that person is soulless? They've done horrible things. They're a horrible person. They're soulless. Are they truly soulless? Are they really soulless? Is there such a thing as soulless? Can you be? It's a question that I just don't have the answer to. So despite having the most advanced imaging capabilities, Two entities have remained enigmatic. Your mind and your soul, or are they one of the same? I don't believe they're one of the same. I don't believe your mind and your soul are combined. Some do, but where is it? The heart, the heart and lungs, somewhere in between? Is it two parts and some in the heart and others in the brain? Who knows? But it can't be the heart because if you do a heart transplant, you're transplanting the heart. If the heart dies, you, you have to take the heart out and put an artificial mechanical circulatory support device in. You don't have a heart at all, but you're still very much alive and many times you're still the same person. So I just don't believe that. Can it be in the brain? Well, I guess it can be, but can it? You can have an injury to your brain but I don't think an injury to the brain is going to injure the soul. I can't, I can't believe that that changes 
your soul, it just changes your mind. That's why I think they're not, I don't think that they are interconnected. It can't exist in every cell because every one of our cells is constantly being replaced. In fact, in seven years, plus or minus, every cell in our body has been replaced. So it can't possibly just exist in every a little piece of it in every single cell or a little piece of our soul just disappears. We wouldn't have a soul after seven or so years, right? So probably not that. So I wanna, want you to think about this. This is my final slide and sort of, when I sat down and looked at this and thought about it, I just thought about it this way. There's 250 billion stars just in our galaxy. There's 100 billion neurons in one person's brain. But there are roughly 37.2 trillion cells in a human body. Now, when you look at that picture, where'd it go? <laughs> when you look at that picture, you see the vastness of space. But what is that? At the end of the day, that's energy. It's all we're looking at up there. In my view, that's just one big energy field. So imagine when we look out at that as a full organism, it seems insurmountably large. But if you are one single cell in your body, looking out over the whole of all of those 37.2 trillion cells, that would probably seem pretty insurmountably large as well. Now we don't know how big the universe is. Is it infinite? Is it not infinite? Nobody really knows. Even Einstein wasn't certain. But again, condense everything down to one cell, because all we are is a collection of one cell at a time. Our whole being is insurmountably large. So the real answer is, I don't know where the hell the soul is. I don't even believe in hell. However, I don't, I don't believe in hell. Okay. You probably do. And we can have that discussion. I don't believe in it. Now, I believe in, in, in standby where you may not make it to the top, but I don't believe in the pit of fire. Hmm. So I want to make sure I acknowledge the people that wrote the stuff that I referred to. We'll go to the camera and Tracy, I'm turning it over to you. Oh Lord. <laughs> oh Lord. Well, you're sitting there going, looking at me. You, you, knew de I was you demanded do it. my attention, Joe. I demanded it. You yes. did. You demanded and commanded my attention. Tell me what you think. Where's the soul live? In my opinion. Um, yes, and there's no right answer. No, right? there is no right answer. But in my opinion, I believe that the soul resides in the brain and the heart. I do. I do. And I believe that because I believe that the soul is human and or it's what we are as a human here on Earth. Mm -hmm. And in your heart and your brain, I believe that it dictates your energy, mm -hmm. your integrity, your appetites, your faith, your, um, what makes you human. So mm -hmm. I believe that involves both heart and head, but I also strongly believe, especially after working with kids and families for so long, that external factors can play a big part in impacting a person's soul. Um, for example, if someone has convictions, very strong convictions that they truly believe are right, mm -hmm. that don't align with your convictions and your beliefs and what goes on in your soul, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're right or wrong or you're right or wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just what they, it's a belief mm -hmm. and a respect amongst people. But I mm -hmm. believe your soul resides in your brain and your heart and your being. How do you, how do you, how do you reconcile the heart transplant patient? How do you reckon, do, do they, do, what happens? Uh, as a matter of fact, my um, uncle uh, had a full heart transplant many years ago. Mm -hmm. And I've had this conversation with my aunt. Uh, mm -hmm. And they are very strong in their Christian faith. And they prayed about that. And they prayed that God would allow the heart that comes into his body to allow him to maintain and retain his personal soul, mm -hmm. his own personal 
mm -hmm. belief system and soul. Mm -hmm. um, so we reconciled it through our faith. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that makes sense. It does. I mean, I think faith can reconcile a lot of things. It can, and I, I was, you know, I, I, you know, and I, I want you to, to, to get involved in this. Oh, don't worry, I, I am, I'm waiting. <laughs> I am definitely not an atheist. Definitely not an atheist. And I, you know, man, men and women, human beings, we don't want to, it's very hard for us to believe in non-existence, kind of like the Egyptians. The, a fate worse than death was to not exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we are born, we start collecting these memories and having this experience of all different kinds. There's all, there's some people that have great lives, some people that have, you know, mediocre lives, some people that have horrible lives. And some people's lives are all three of those things right. through various different vacillations of it during their course of their lifetime. I don't want to believe that there's nothing. Okay. I just have a hard time necessarily believing the, the, the heaven and hell part of religious teachings Judeo-Christian beliefs. Um, I know there's other faiths out there that have different ideas right. about what happens to you. Right. Um, but it's uh, it's it's you know I'm I'm kind of on the fence a little bit. Sure. Um, sure. I you know I think that I think that you can have um, injury. You can have. Mm -hmm medication, you can have just simply biology mm -hmm. that completely screws your mind, your brain up chemically. You can have chemical imbalances that mm -hmm. cause you to do all kinds of things, which mm -hmm. can get you pretty severely punished here on earth right. when you get caught with that. But it's hard for me to, to believe that it's not a chemical imbalance, it's Satan causing this person to do that and they're satanic therefore and are doomed to the pit of fire for all eternity when really at the end of the day they were sick. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to reconcile. It doesn't mean they should just linger in society. I don't believe that. Don't think I'm one of those people that, you know, just let everybody out. There's nothing, you know, we, we have to help them. No, you go killing people or doing something really bad. Right. You need to be put someplace. Um, but there's something fundamentally wrong, clearly. I agree with that. And I, I, my perspective, I know, is completely different than the medical perspective. Um, because in my job, when I have a client sitting across from me, whether it's a six-year-old child, an 18-year-old child, or a young adult, they may not have the vocabulary or the background or the life skills to express right and wrong if they haven't been taught that. They may mm -hmm. not have that ability to explain why they did what they did. Mm -hmm. um, and so it is not my job to judge them. It is my job to meet them where they are, um, respect their beliefs and their values, whatever they may be, and not interject my own. Um, even if I'm sitting there thinking, kids, you're about to go to jail, you mm -hmm. know, um, because it's my job to, and my passion to look deeper. Uh, the youngest gang member that I've had in my office that told me, miss, they told me that if I killed someone to be in their gang, that they would love me and they would be my family forever. That was the first person that ever told this kid that they loved him. How old do you think that kiddo was? Nine. Nine years old. Nine years old. And he was expected to go out and kill somebody mm -hmm. to prove his worth right. and value to this gang. Yeah. Does he have a soul? Sure, somewhere in there I'm sure he does. But has he had the ability to grow it? Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Make any sense? Yes, it makes perfectly good sense to me. But let, let me let me get, uh, and I've got some thoughts about that. But I'm going to say this first: our job is easy. We use data imaging. We have we have we have anatomy. It's always there. It's going to be there. It was there yesterday. What you do far more complex because you're dealing with Absolutely. something that you just really can't see and measure and it's controlled by so many things that we have no clue what is actually going on. My job's easy. See, and I just I just agree with you on your job being easy, first of all, because y'all impress the hell out of me. But one of the things that you guys can do or medical professionals or social workers or teachers that I think it's super important. I had a, I got to give props to my daughter. She's a nursing student. I talked to her, her last Congratulations. night. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, Tell her to come work here. I, Devin, you want to come work here? Devin, got to come work, work uh, in Houston, work in Woodlands. Exactly. Um, I had a great conversation with her about this last night, as a matter of fact. She's doing her clinical rotation at the VA this mm -hmm. semester. Mm -hmm. And she said, Mom, I think it is super important as healthcare professionals or social workers or educators or first responders to remember that when we go in, we may have anatomy, we may have everything you just described. She said, but the one thing that we can't forget to offer the patient or the client is hope and compassion. Mm -hmm. And she said, because if we don't go in with some sort of a hope and a compassion, no matter how dire the circumstance, the patient is gonna pick up on that. So it's harder for you guys than you think, because well, you have to go in and, and give bad news a lot. I know heart surgeons that will refuse to operate on a patient that says, I I'm not gonna, I'm gonna die. I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna make it through this case and they have refused to operate on them because of that. And I think there's a tremendous amount of influence the power of thought and suggestion can have exactly. on the outcome of a patient. Exactly, and recovery Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. Right, sorry to interrupt you. No, that's okay. Okay, I'm gonna answer the last one first and then go from there. <laughs> I do believe if a patient tells me I'm gonna die today, I believe the patients have an insight in themselves. You cannot ignore that and dismiss it. Patient knows what their soul is feeling, go to the soul. And if the patient says that, I do agree with that, that they need, we need to stop what we're doing and really look at what the patient is saying. And I agree with the heart surgeons don't operate, mm -hmm. the patient says that. I think cancel and go for another day, get spiritual care, try to uh, figure out what's going on, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which if we can. Now, let me start with clinically. Now, clinically, like we're talking about heart and, and the brain, unfortunately, and the neurosurgeons will tell you neurologists, heart is much more advanced than the field of neuro, much more advanced. Heart has failed, like you said. Take the heart out, put a valve, plug it in, it's all for good. Brain fails, there's no solution. No. And how to heal it, nobody has figured that out. The research is ongoing, ongoing. And I'll tell you, there's not really anything on the highlights right now. So poor neurologists and neurosurgeons have a hard time. They're trying to figure something which nobody has figured out yet. Now I'll tell you about the soul. I mean, I believe, I do believe in having the soul, and I believe your soul, I'm not sure what you, you want to say it's your soul, but I, feel, I believe who, your soul carries over. You have to pay it forward. You have to have, a, mm -hmm. a, you have to have, what people will remember after you're gone, you want to call it your soul or that you paid it forward. Mm -hmm. but how, how you treat it, like your legacy. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So yes. what is your legacy? Is your legacy going to be money and buildings? No. People remember how you treated them. Right. And how you, how you, how you, you know, uh, uh, affected their life. And I will say it here. I'm sorry to embarrass him. Somebody like Clinton right here. The way he treated me the first time when I met him here made me always feel that now he has a legacy in my mind. Mm -hmm. And that, I believe, is part of the soul situation. It's your legacy. You have to be really, I already think you have your legacy It's one time. Mm -hmm. You cannot ruin it, it's never, you cannot fix it again. You have to take every action that you do today and every day, that that's affecting your legacy. Mm -hmm. And that's very important to me. My credibility, my legacy is very important to me. I'm, I cannot tell you I'm a good mm -hmm. person or I'm a bad person, I don't know. I don't know what a good or a bad per person is. Person. No, it does but not I'll matter. The, you are. I'll tell you, yes. I'll mostly. Te I'll tell you, mostly. Good. thank you, sir. There's and I'll times. tell you, I go to church, and I, maybe some people are going to be mad at me, I go to church, not because the priest is in church, because what's going on in church, because when I go there, there's a group of people mm -hmm. that are always waiting for me to go that day, and they know if I'm not there, there is something wrong, and they worry about me. 
-hmm. And I, those group of people, I feel I owe them to show up every time because they're my group, they care about me. Mm -hmm. They think when I'm not there, they have a seat for me because they know I have a hard time. And they're always looking out for me. The person give me communion every time is looking out what am I sitting to give me communion. For me, that is uh, like, that, that's their soul, or whatever you want to call it, but I look that for every time I go. Mm -hmm. So that's my little simplifying. You know, I'm not, a, I'm a simple person. Simple, that's okay. very good. But I think it's very good. I think it's, I think it's meaningful. I think sometimes the deepest, most meaningful things are really quite simple. Right. And we overanalyze a whole lot of things, at least I know I do. Um, so, you believe it's in the heart and the, and, the, and, the, and the brain, so you believe the mind and the soul are interconnected? With the heart. With the heart. And All yes. of them are connected? Yes. Dr. Samir, is the, is the, is it in, is, does it reside in us, around us, all of us, next to us, what do you think? I think I'm gonna have to go with the age and teaching. It does reside in you, and you can feel it from one person to the other. You think it resides in us, yes. but not necessarily heart and lungs. No. Heart and, and brain. No. And, uh-huh, yeah, answer it. Hello, you're on the air. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, you're hey, on the John air. John Ingram. Who's this? John Ingram. Hey, John. How are you? How's it going? Doing good. <laughs> what do you think? I'm uh, watching you live, am I not? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we're right here, waving okay. at you. Hey, John. So there's a delay. There's a delay. There's a delay. Okay, yeah, it's John Ingram. Hey, it's John, it's John Ingram. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. We hear you. Okay. Well, oh, well, tell tell him. Hey, John, you have to turn your John. You have to turn your volume down. We're getting that feedback back. Let me try a couple of things. Is it any better now? It's fine for us. Okay. So I think it's my phone gets too close to the computer. I think that's what it is. So I wanted to interject. Um, you know, almost every religion believes that animals do not have a soul. Humans, what separates us from animals is that we as humans have a soul, right? Yep. So, you know, if you've ever had a pet dog, like I'm a big dog person, yeah. our little dog, it has a personality. He knows right from wrong based on what we've taught him. He has everything, but he's not human. And if you, you know, he, he's an animal, so he doesn't search for religion. He doesn't search for, uh, he doesn't seem to have a need for a moral compass like humans do. So, you know, it, 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 they, if it's in the brain, well, he has a brain. If it's in the heart, well, he has a heart, lungs, whatever, but yet doesn't have a soul, right, according to, to most religions. But just talking about religion for a second, it does give you a moral compass, whichever one you believe in. At least it gives you a moral compass of right and wrong. And um, But going back to the animal thing, I think if you want to find where the soul resides, you have to try to find what's different about a group of animals than, than, than humans. If you, find, if you follow a pack of lions from one country to the next, they're all doing the same thing, they're hunting to survive, but they don't have different religions among themselves, and they don't have different rules of right and wrong, because they're not in search of some eternal uh, accomplishment or some internal uh, existence beyond this. They're just here for survival. And um, I once heard it said, not that I believe this, but I once heard it said that if you want to know exactly how it is once you die, it was exactly how it was before you were born. Yeah. Which you could argue that because maybe maybe there was an existence before you were born, but you just can't recall it in this present state of, of the physical being that you're in. So I just wanted to give you um, some thoughts about that. You know, John, I've heard that same thing that we, you know, that there are people that believe we come from nothing. Mm -hmm. yeah. But then we are, and because of our perhaps larger brain, you know, we're more sentient, we, we, we think about, you know, our existence and why, we question why, whereas animals don't question why, we, at least we don't think they do. Right. I, you know, um, but then it's very difficult for us to imagine what is an inevitability. It, the, every single day, 
is an opportunity for it to be our last one. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, there's, there's no predictability to it. And that frightens humans. Mm -hmm. The human experience, I think, is, is one of the most interesting and unique ones around. But, you know, I think that, you know, that other species, um, you know, it's, I hear what you're saying, the domesticated dog, you know, there are certainly some, you know, of the, of the, uh, uh, of the, the uh, uh, more advanced uh, ape species, monkey species, uh, primate species is what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, they have some pretty significant definitive personalities. Mm-hmm. And some of them, you know, they may not have religion as we know it, or do we know what they do? Do we, we don't know what they think. And I think to your point, Dr. Smear, that the, the, w- the brain is so incredibly complex. And mm-hmm. what is it? Dopamine and some uh, other neuroreceptors and, you know, that yeah. many, that many, that many neurons and even more synapses than that. Mm-hmm. And you think about how a hundred billion neurons, a hundred billion, that's a very big number just in one skull. It's very, I don't think we'll ever understand it, frankly. I don't think we can. But we know that if you do like Phineas, Phineas Gage and stick a pipe through the front of your head and damage your frontal lobe, you become a different person. I'm not sure I believe that, to be honest with you. I, I do believe that if you have a catastrophic event that could reflect on you in different ways, I think it depends on the person themselves, not the two mm-hmm. people are alike. If you have a catastrophic yeah. event, it would affect your outlook on life in different ways. So I think it's, I don't believe, believe in that, to be honest. So you don't think the frontal lobe is the, har- is the, is the harbinger, of, or not the harbinger, but the heart where, where your personality is harbored? No, it is, I mean, there's, talk, and I'm going to say talk because I've got neurons all on confirm. There's the inhibition lobe. You become disinhibited when you have frontal lobe injury. But again, as much, again, neuro they do not know. Mm-hmm. In the heart, you know that the left ventricle is the left ventricle. Mm-hmm. The you know the, exactly. You know it's pumping blood to the body. In neuro, it's all postulation. Mm-hmm. All of it. I agree. Absolutely. Well, if you look at trauma, at people that are victim, you know, that suffer with trauma, every single trauma victim, be it severe post-trauma or systematic post-trauma or situational post-trauma, every person is going to handle that differently depending on how they process it in their brain. Mm -hmm. So, and we see that more and more in our veterans. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, that's why people say when they're they're recovering from a trauma or from a stroke, that's the way it should be. That there's nobody following a blueprint. The blueprint is your own blueprint. Mm-hmm. So I think there's so much we don't know in this area. Which is fascinating. Mm-hmm. You can take two, two people, you can take identical twins, yes. subject them to the same event, and they will each handle it differently. Correct. Absolutely. And that's just mm-hmm. dopamine and epi. Mm-hmm. Neurotransmitters. Mm-hmm. Where they go, how it, how, it, how it fires, what fires. I mean, we just don't know. It's just, but getting back to the soul, if we have a soul, I, I don't believe that it is discernible. I don't believe it lives in the heart and the brain. I think if we do have a soul, we are our soul. And that, that's what I was saying earlier, is that it, it, it is you, your humanness. It's, it's you as a human, heart, brain, all of you um, makes up your soul. Yes, Absolutely. but I don't necessarily believe that people that do bad things do so because they have a bad soul. They may not have a conscience. They may not. Well, they're but sociopaths. They sociopaths ex- don't have conscience. And then they're but right. Why? That that's the that's the billion dollar question. Is it because they have a bad soul, or is it because they have a a, a yet, un, yet not understood biochemical imbalance. Which is it? So, John? Yeah, so let me ask you this. Because you can talk about heart transplants and lung transplants and how the person feels after. 
what if you had a body and you were able to take a different person's brain and do a brain, brain transplant? Now, that person that received the transplant, is that body the person or is that new brain that came in that, that person? And the consciousness is going to come with it, is it not? The consciousness of that brain is going to come with it. And basically a huge part of your soul is that we were born with a conscience, that animals generally don't have much of a conscience, right? So it seems to me, if you had to isolate an organ, it seems to me it, it must largely be in the brain. Mm -hmm. What would you think about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think so. But I again, you know, that it's philosophical. Mm -hmm. Is, you know, is our mind which is what's going to consist of our memories and our behaviors and all of that kind of thing. Inter is it the same as the soul or are they two, you know, completely different things? And so I think that's really the question. If you believe the br that the soul resides in the brain, then yeah, you transplant the head, that brain and soul goes with it. If you believe it's in the heart uh, or a combination, then I guess you're going to have you know, two halves of the soul. I don't know what's going to happen. So, you know, I just, uh, I, I, yeah, I have no clue. But I do know that when you look out into space, it looks insurmountably big. But one cell in 32.7 trillion cells would probably look insurmountably big. So, you know, I think, it, I think our soul is just, it exists as an energy field that has nothing to do with our physical state. Essentially what I was trying to say. Okay. Then how is it attached to us? How is it, it attached, attached to us? I mean, you know, I mean, you know, be... you know, look at look at quantum quantum physics and quantum mechanics. There's, you know, there's how does how does how is how is it possible that, you know, this solid desk is really is really porous? You know? I mean, how, how you know, I mean, there's things that I just don't know. And Einstein's not here anymore, so I can't ask him. Dr. Samir, let's close it out. Again, I believe it's all polyfactorial. And the only thing that we have is our soul is, is there to help us, I uh, mean, uh, determines who we are in the future. So and it's a collection of our memories and our experiences. And I do believe, yes, if you transplant somebody's brain to somebody else, they're going to have to adopt that memory. Yes, of course. Of course. I mean, look, I mean, you have to be logical. You transplant somebody's heart. It, uh, the heart is the same heart. It's the same RV, same LV, yeah. same mitral valve. Right. We behave that same way. So by logic, it has to be the same way. Yes. Yeah. But you're not going to take a brain. You're, 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 you're transplanting. If you're transplanting, I mean, you know, I mean, they are experimenting with transplanting heads. I mean, they are actually doing these experiments. But... It would be because the brain was still intact, but the physical body was dying and couldn't, that couldn't, couldn't continue to keep the brain alive. Who we are is all up here. I mean, I mean that's who we are. So, you know, you're not taking a bad brain and putting it into somebody or just transplanting brains for the sake of transplanting brains. I mean, I'll tell you, I never use that word because, you know, I'm having to transplant. There's no bad organ. We're always going to take an appropriate organ for you. Okay? <laughs> okay, I think on that note, yeah, yeah. John, it was good talking to you. Thanks so much for calling in. Hey, Dr. Samir is taking you to Egypt, and we're sending you a Perf Web Cup. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you all very much. So let me just very quickly go over our schedule. This is going to be very important, so pay attention. Okay, our next program is going to be in March. And it's going to be uh, the cases I wish I could forget. And I've got four or five of them. Um, there's going to be on Thursday the 26th. That's on Wednesday the 12th. On Thursday the 26th, it's going to be talking with a panel of the things we love and hate about the perfusion profession. Saturday the 28th is uh, Stephanie Ebus's program on women in perfusion which is going to be i think an excellent program we have uh a a a, a, a person coming t i can't remember her first name trifoletti uh sounds irish i guess um <laughs> good irish name right but uh irish. but she's coming she's actually going to be here in the studio talking about the unique challenges facing women in perfusion the history of 
uh, Women in Perfusion, Ann Greco, she's local, and uh, she's one of the treasurer of the American Board of Cardiovascular Perfusion. So Ann, looking forward to seeing you. And uh, Stephanie's gonna talk about starting a family as a perfusionist, because our job is rather demanding call, emergencies, middle of the night, and it's very hard to do. Then in April, you're coming back with common youth behaviors with serious societal implications. So check the web, perfweb.us, click schedule, look at what we've got coming up. And uh, I wanna thank you all for being here, Dr. Samir and Tracy. Thank I you. wanna thank both of you for your contributions to Thanks this. Thanks for having us. You're thank invaluable you and us, you yes. do so much to make this program better. So for everybody that's out there in web world, thank you on behalf of myself and them. So thank you. see you in, uh, in, uh, in March. Mix cannulae, expanding performance standards. High performance cannulae for direct and femoral cannulation in minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Levanova's complete range of mix dedicated products allow easy and reproducible procedures. The portfolio includes the sutureless aortic valve Percival, Memo 4D for mitral valve repair, the HeartLink system for assisting the perfusionist in applying goal-directed perfusion therapy, and a broad choice of high-performance dedicated cannulae. Leva Nova's range of cannulae suit every cannulation technique for minimally invasive cardiac surgery. Venous and arterial femoral cannulation can be performed using the Wrap Venous Cannula and the Easy Flow Duo. For arterial direct and venous femoral cannulation, the EasyFlow aortic cannula and the wrap are available. For venous femoral access, the Levanova wrap cannula features a dual stage configuration for optimal drainage of the inferior and superior vena cava without interfering with the right atrium. The high flow dynamics of wrap improves the capability of drainage with a low pressure drop. An optional Selinger dilator kit is available to perform percutaneous insertion. The Levanova EasyFlow Duo cannula is designed for a safe and smooth femoral arterial cannulation. Its conical dispersion tip design allows a more gentle flow in the femoral artery, and its red cap avoids blood backflow during obturator removal. A dilator kit for percutaneous insertion is also included with the cannula. Easy flow cannulae are designed for safe, reproducible direct aortic cannulation and include a malleable stylet to aid cannulation insertion, facilitating bloodless introduction into the aortic arch, as well as a special conical dispersion tip for a more gentle flow in the vessel to reduce shear stress. care program at Huntsville Hospital is approaching its 20 year anniversary as we began to grow as a hospital and provide more complex services to our community the need for point of care testing became very clear in our organization many of our departments consider the EPOT device to be crucial to their ability to quickly move their patients from entry to the hospital to procedural room. It helps them monitor the patient's status during their procedures and post procedure so it's very integrated into our entire continuum of patient care. If you have any patient population where blood management is crucial, then a point of care device is very useful in those types of settings. It can provide a quick result on a very small amount of blood and, and that is really important in some of our patient population. We are starting a new process where we're gonna screen our patients on the floor for sepsis. The patient can look and, and actually feel okay they will show us signs and symptoms of sepsis. So what we do when they show these signs, we get a lactate level. Lactic acid is a, a product of the sepsis cascade. So with sepsis, the inflammatory light switch goes on, the cascade starts churning, and unfortunately, once it starts going, we have to stop it. It will not stop on its own. The faster the lab draw, the faster the lab results, and the faster you can, you can act on it. 
the process in the lab is what the process is. It just takes a certain amount of time for the instruments to run those tests. I mean, we're talking 30 minutes even on a stat because that's the process. You, this is how long it takes. There's not really anything you can do about that. For every hour you wait to give an antibiotic, the mortality for that patient increases 8%. So now that we have the handheld device, the nurse can get those results within a few minutes and we know how to treat that patient. If a patient is going into septic shock, we do not have minutes to spare. We have got to get it done quickly. So when you get the little beep from the epoch that says your results are in, you're, you go with it. You don't even think twice about it. You're like, this is, this is good. This is what I'm gonna do for this patient. The next steps are clear. I think our mortality on the, the initial floors dropped by almost 50% in the first three to six months. At this point, we are about hospital-wide. We, I think we'll be hospital-wide another two to four months. So this has become a huge program uh, within our, our system. Without the EPOC device, it would really be hard for us to get everything done in the timely manner. So it's really helped us to get our program going. I mean, whether you're a surgeon, whether you're a medicine doctor, whether you're a dermatologist, you want to be able to do things in a timely fashion so that you can be most effective. This really makes a difference in patient outcomes. Like all perfusion professionals today, we are busy and frequently short-staffed. Does taking time off for a conference create a burden for your teammates? Has reimbursement for your continuing education dropped? Have you priced the cost of going to a meeting lately? Registration fees, airfare, transportation and parking, hotel, and meals out? This totals up to having an out-of-pocket expense of over $2,500 and then you hope the content is good. Perfusion Education has heard your concerns. They have a simple and seamless system that works on any platform, computer, tablet, or even your phone. You can chat during the program or even phone in and be live on the air. The content, second to none. Perfusion Education is by Perfusionist and for Perfusionist. Create a free account and check us out today.